Oh. Okay, uh, we're going to get started here. Uh, if one person or anybody out there online can just unmute for just one second, tell you you can hear everything here, we're going to go ahead and get started. If somebody could just tell me we're we're live. We can hear you. Perfect. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining us here today. Uh, we are uh, here for our Tactical Tuesday Officer Development Training Series. We're in Module 17. And today we're going to talk about trailer and RV fires, which you may scratch your head and wonder what, but uh, but I think as we go through here, you're going to find that these are some of our more dangerous fires that we respond to and can be some of our more complicated fires, even for as, as small as they are. So with that, we'll talk about the disclaimer. Obviously, we always do and just understand that fires in mobile homes and manufactured homes, and we're going to talk about both of those because there's a difference between the two. And then RVs are common, but, uh, but they obviously have a tr tremendous potential for exposures, uh, for exposure problems for us in most of our trailer parks just due to their uh, their positioning and and the situation that we have there with them and as far as their uh, the uh, how they're all stuffed in together here we'll also talk about just some of the construction features and things that go along with uh, with trailers and, and some of the differences we have between regular residential construction and, uh, and rvs and and trailers we'll also talk about some of the avenues of fire spread some of the challenges that we have associated with with fires in these types of uh, vehicles and, and structures and then some of the things we can do as firefighters to try to improve our safety and, and operational effectiveness uh, when we respond to these incidents. And as always, we tell you that if you have questions about uh, some of the materials that are covered in here, please don't hesitate to, to go to your uh, department's uh, operations chief and discuss anything you have questions there. We certainly will answer anything we can online here or in, in person. Uh, and but, uh, but just understand everything we do here, we try to follow volume two but uh, certainly if we have any questions, you can fall back to your department's SOPs, guidelines, and directives. So with that, mobile home fires and statistics. Here are just a couple of short statistics here, as you can see here. Uh, we average about 206 civilian deaths a year in mobile homes, uh, 434 civilian injuries, about $179 million in direct damage. Uh, mobile homes typically make up about 10% of the uh, single family structures in the United States. So they are out there. Some cities have a lot more than others. Uh, I know in, in Tempe, where I used to work, we had oh, a half dozen trailer parks probably or mobile home parks. Uh, other cities have, um, as we go further east, you, you're going to see a whole lot more of those. They may make up a higher percentage of your, of your residential structures. I also understand that mobile homes are not just small houses. Uh, there is a significant difference in the construction uh, that goes along with making these uh, mobile homes and, and uh, manufactured homes. Uh, they're just not built to the same standards as residential homes. They will have a lot of similarities. Obviously, they have plumbing, electrical, they've got uh, lights and, and sewer and all those kind of things, but they're uh, typically made of a much smaller dimension, uh, lumber that's used in these uh, types of structures because obviously these are designed to be portable. So obviously they can't uh, make concrete floors and other things and then try to transport them down the road. So you will see on these, uh, both RVs and mobile homes, much smaller dimension lumber. Uh, you'll see thinner uh, uh, wood as far as the floors. The, you won't see the three quarter inch flooring uh, you, that you might see in a, a uh, house that a residential structure that has a basement, something of that nature on the floor. You won't see the, the, the you'll see lightweight paneling in a lot of these uh, structures, which burns and uh, creates a, a very rapid re release heat, uh, heat release rate and a number of other things associated with the construction factors associated with these things. So understand that uh, that these are not just small homes. There's a lot of differences, and we'll talk about those as we go through the morning. Most of the uh, the RVs and, and trailers, well, mobile homes and RVs, uh, the skeletons built with lightweight steel. Uh, you'll have lightweight uh, members. You'll have two by twos in, in a lot of situations as far as the structural members, uh, and a lot of them are going to be covered with at least the old style mobile homes will be covered with a lightweight aluminum uh, covering. Uh, some of the new stuff now has some siding, T uh, T111 siding and other types of siding, but, but just understand that it's typically very lightweight and has the potential to fail very early. Also understand that fuel loads inside the mobile homes is a contributing factor, as we know, obviously, between the furnishings, the, the uh, wall coverings, the lightweight paneling and other things that you have the ability for these things for fires and trailers and RVs to not only uh, start and, and develop much very quick, but reach flash over stage at a, at a very, very early stage in a fire as compared to a residential structure. So we'll talk a little bit about the basics. So if we look at uh, a mobile home and a manufactured home, the difference is basically the year that they were built. 
mobile homes are those that were built prior to the year 1976. There was a bunch of changes that occurred after the year 1976 as far as uh, manufacturing sta uh, standards. And so after 1976, they be started be calling, uh, calling them manufactured homes. And we'll go through some of the differences here in a second. But basically what we used to have with mobile homes, as you guys know, we had the single wide and a double wide. Occasionally you'd see a triple wide somewhere, but for the most part you saw an eight, uh, probably about a, uh, a 12 by 60, a 10 by 60, something of that nature is what you see in a lot of your older uh, mobile home parks. And they're, they were basically were put together, and I'll show you some of the construction here in a second. They were basically put together, uh, hooked up to a truck, driven out to a location, put up on blocks, the wheels and tires were taken off, put up on blocks, they put some skirting around the bottom and that was your home. Um, and those are certainly in our older neighborhoods and our older parks, those are, those are still existing in a, in a very large number uh, throughout the valley. We get to 1976, the challenge that the, and I'm not sure, I can't remember if it was HUD or somebody else had come out with a new uh, requirements as far as uh, the construction requirements and it changed quite a bit where now you no longer had the aluminum siding, you went to some T111 or other type of sidings, uh, a much uh, beefier system as far as the roof structure and other types of uh, building materials, still not the same as residential construction itself, that were our typical residential construction we see, but a much uh, beefier system and a much better design uh, so that you see a little, a little more, uh, uh, a better design as far as the construction and the durability of the residence itself. And we'll show you some of the examples of some of that stuff. This is what we're looking at. If you look at a mobile home, that's typically what you see, certainly an older style one on the left there, and a manufactured home is the one that's built after 1976 on the right, and there's uh, quite a few differences here. Pre-1976, this is what you saw. You saw they, they started out with a couple of metal I-beams, and then they put flooring on there, and they put uh, the little two-by-two two wood, wood frame, some aluminum skin across the top, a, a little bit of a truss system in the roof line, but usually there wasn't much of an attic space, if at all, maybe six inches at best. Um, paneling, lightweight paneling throughout the, the uh, walls, the, the ceiling, uh, and then uh, and, and then some type of flooring, which typically is less than either half inch uh, plywood or something of that nature that uh, was all they had on the floor with covered with with uh, uh, probably flammable carpet. And that's what we saw back in uh, pre-1976 days. So this is a double wide. You can see this is kind of the construction and some of the an ad for what we had before and a layout of, of what a, a typical mobile home would look like. You see, and I've got some additional layouts that we'll show you in a second here, but this was something, a design that was not unusual. I know my, my grandparents lived in, in one of these single wides like this for, for years and years, so I spent a lot of time as a kid in, in one of these, so very familiar with the layout on these, and they're pretty pretty standard layout, but you'll see a double wide there on the, on the right, and there's a, a tremendous amount of these obviously still in existence out there. Some of the layout concerns that we have, and this is kind of just a, a, a very standard, simple layout, as you'll see in, in what we have here. But anything pre-96, this is you're going to see, or sorry, pre-76, this is not an unusual layout. This is what you'll see a lot of times on, on a lot of these structures. Uh, and, and the doors may be on opposite sides of the building, uh, on, in, I mean, I'm sorry, the trailer on, on some of them. Sometimes they're on the same side, just depends on, the, on when they were built and what, what manufacturer. But just understand the big thing with the pre-76 trailers is going to be the hallway. The hallway is going to be our, our biggest challenge as far as getting in and out. Uh, and transitioning from the front to the back of the uh, the trailer. And, and whereas in the manufactured homes, you have a little more open floor plan, the pre-76 trailers are gonna be very, very limited floor plans. And uh, you'll you'll see a very narrow hallway, which becomes a challenge for us as we, we talk about firefighter um, injuries, fatalities, and, and some of the challenges associated with operating in these uh, uh, narrow hallways. But also understand that because of the way it's laid out, it creates basically, as they say here, a horizontal chimney, which allows the products of combustion to travel from one end of the trailer to the other very quickly. And when things go wrong, they go wrong very quickly as well. Um, if you look at this, you basically, if you come in the door and, and, you, and you find a kitchen on your right, obviously there's gonna be a hallway to your left and a couple of bedrooms and probably one bathroom. As you get into double wides, you may see a little more space, obviously, than, than we have here, but the single wides, you're, you're, you're pretty limited. You're gonna have which probably two bedrooms and, and one bath, a living room and a small kitchen is what you're gonna see here. Um, here's another couple of layouts. This is the, the more standard uh, type of layout. You've got a, a 15 by 60, a 13 by 50. So these are some of the layouts you can see here. Once again, you've got the common hallway we talk about, a, a, a common room of some kind, whether it be a living room or a dining room and, and kitchen kind of combination, and then, the, and then a, uh, a bathroom and a couple of bedrooms. Well, pretty standard when you come in there. You can also, as you, as you walk around and do a 360 on a trailer, 
especially the single wides, it should be reasonably easy to kind of figure out the layout of the structure. If you see the one end of the structure and you realize that it's a bedroom, obviously you're going to have the kitchen on the opposite end of the structure because they, they typically have the master bedroom on one end and the kitchen on the opposite end. So if you come in the come in the door and your kitchen's on your right, the master bedrooms are going to be on your left, obviously, and vice versa. So it just depends on the, on the layout of the structure. And, and sometimes by making your, or should be able to, by making a 360, have a reasonably good idea where the, where the, uh, where the bedrooms are on the structure if you're trying to locate someone after hours or something as far as the search and, and, uh, and your search and rescue uh, activities. So this is a uh, pretty standard. I think anybody has been in a, a single wide trailer from, from the old days, this is a, a pretty standard layout of what you'll see. Uh, a lot of flammable materials, um, very lightweight materials. I know uh, as you walk into some of the, the mobile homes that are out there in some of your trailer parks as you walk in without a fire in them, sometimes you're a little worried you're gonna fall through the floor as it is. Uh, much less when you have uh, structural members being deteriorated due to fire and other issues. So your manufactured homes are obviously anything post-76. Uh, they typically have quite a bit of a different, uh, a, a, a larger square footage floor plan, a larger footprint typically. Uh, and they are a little better built. They have some wall studs, uh, obviously ceiling rafters and those kind of things are a little bit better. The siding's a little bit better than the aluminum uh, skin that they have on the pre-76 models. Uh, larger living space, which gives a lot more floor plans, a lot more opportunities for uh, some uh, different layouts than we have with the single wides and the, uh, the old manufactured before pre-76. But this is what it looks like when we're constructing our homes here, the manufactured homes. So you can see you have uh, some, some two by two, sometimes with some two by fours in certain areas of the, of the, of the structure. You can see this house has a, a small attic space here. It looks like maybe about a 16 inch attic space here. So there is a possibility that you may have extension into the attic on, on some of the manufactured homes versus the mobile homes. You can see this one here has a little bit smaller attic space, maybe a six inch attic space here, but you can see some of the, the lumber, even though it looks relatively solid and the, it's certainly a much better built and much better constructed uh, structure than the pre-76 models. They're still very lightweight as, as compared to a a regular residential structure. You can see here we got a little bit of an attic space with some cellulose. So you have potential uh, potential for maybe blown fiberglass. I can't tell obviously from here obviously, but uh, you may have some uh, possibility of extension into the attic space and something you'll need to check anytime that you have a working fire and a, and a structure to check for another area of extension. Uh, these uh, some of these models it looks like they have obviously a little bit bigger attic space. Uh, now this uh, raises a little bit of a question for us whether or not we're gonna, we, can, we can even provide vertical ventilation on structures of this nature. And in a little while when we get to that point, I'll, I'll have uh, Captain Liddell talk a little bit about uh, whether we do that. We typically, and, and we'll talk about, we typically do not do vertical ventilation on trailers or manufactured homes or maybe isolated incidents where it's appropriate, but in the vast majority of our, our types of responses to these structures, we don't. You can see a little bit of a difference, obviously a different floor plan for manufactured home post 76. You can see it's quite a bit different than the, the single wide trailers that we have. So a lot more flexibility as far as the, the layout of the structure and also uh, and not quite as easy to read from the outside uh, as far as the layout, but, uh, but uh, and it creates a, a little more open floor plan, but it also has uh, uh, a little less challenges as far as the, the narrow hallways, which creates some concerns that we'll talk about later here in the, in the discussion. As we talk about manufactured homes and mobile homes, understand that typically the largest void space is gonna be between the floor joists and the ground. And uh, should obviously be sounded anytime we're on the interior. If you look here at the uh, picture on the right, uh, that's, a, that's what it looks like under a, a good percentage of our mobile homes and manufactured homes throughout the valley here. They got a skirt that typically protects that, the view of that, um, but that's what you're gonna see. You can see they've taken the tires off of the, the axles there. They basically put it up on blocks. Uh, tied it down with, uh, with some type of tie down and, uh, and that's what you look like underneath there. And you can see also a number of poke throughs here in the floor. Uh, typically these floors, obviously the post 76 trailers have a little bit better flooring system as far as the uh, materials involved, but the pre 76, uh, certainly you're probably gonna see some half inch uh, plywood or something of that nature as far as the flooring goes. So that can fail very quickly if you have fire in the undercarriage of these, uh, these structures. Also, we talked about the small uh, truss space that may be located overhead uh, in these trailers. So it's once again, another area that we have to check and, and check for extension. And then also just another little, little factor just to be aware of, and anybody that's uh, responded to these type of trailers understand they typically have a, a set or two of stairs uh, associated with the access and entries on either side of the trailer. 
uh, depending on how it's laid out, but, uh, but they're typically very flimsy and they move. So the potential for a slip, trip, and fall hazard, or as we come out of a structure, trying to get in or out of a structure with the hose line may be a bit of a challenge for us. And, and so we may have a situation where when we went in, the, tr the stairs were there. As we came out, they've been moved or they've, uh, they've been pushed to the side. And we may have a, a small fall hazard there if we're not paying attention, especially in limited visibility. Watch for additions. If you, anybody that's been through any of the, the mobile home parks or manufactured home parks or trailer parks, whatever we wanna call them, if you drive around in there at all, spend any time at all, you'll notice that just about every trailer in there has some type of uh, addition of some kind, whether it be a, an addition, a, a, a storage room or, or something in these structures, which can create some challenges for us, not only from the, the fire load associated with these things, but also uh, challenges associated with the search and rescue and access and entry and, and uh, uh, egress in, in some of these structures as well. Uh, you'll find that uh, that typically uh, not all of these additions are built to code. Uh, you know, obviously they start out with a smaller residence and realize they need a little more room, whether it's for storage or or an extra bedroom or whatever. So they they build one onto the side of the structure and and it may or may not comply with all the building requirements. So. You may have limited entry, you may have uh, single one entry, no exits. You may have a, a number of other challenges associated with that. And I know in one of the near misses we had in Tempe, the, uh, the storage uh, that was attached, the attached storage had a tremendous uh, fire load inside there with a bunch of plastic chairs and tables. I think it was like a catering business of some kind or something that had a bunch of plastic chairs and tables, which created a, a tremendous fire load that we weren't expecting uh, just based upon the, the extra addition to the room or to the structure. But as, you, as we go through here, you'll see a good percentage of the trailers that we and manufactured at home we show, we'll show today will have some type of addition of some kind or Arizona room or, or something that may create some challenges for us as far as the completing the search and, and creating some challenges uh, getting in or out of the structure. Understand that these are, uh, that trailer fires are dangerous. This is an incident line of duty death that occurred in a, in a trailer in Pennsylvania. Once again, we had the uh, the attached uh, addition, which created the problem. If you go back and look at the line of duty death report, there was an addition to the to this trailer that had a the, where the fire started and continued to feed the, the fire when they had a flashover and, and this uh, lieutenant was killed in this uh, mobile home fire. So very dangerous. Don't downplay the uh, dangers associated with these trailers. And we're going to talk more about that in another section of this uh, uh, discussion this morning. But you can see here, obviously, a small trailer that they built an addition to. Uh, which creates uh, not only access and egress problems, but uh, you can see trying to get in and out of this structure, if something goes wrong, it's gonna be pretty difficult. The windows aren't big enough to get out of, or to climb out of, uh, certainly out of the trailer itself. And, uh, and once again, we have no idea what the layout and configuration of this structure may be, as far as trying to be able to get in and, and out of this structure in a, in, a, in a safe manner. Build overs. Uh, this is something you'll see typically on, on, on a lot, especially some of the older structures. Uh, I know, I remember very vividly, unfortunately, going to my grandmother's house and, and redoing the, the foam on her roof about every five years, it seemed like, between painting it and, and redoing the, the foam. And it, they continued to deteriorate, obviously, an older trailer. And, and so we'd thought many times about doing some type of build over on that one just because of the leaks. It seemed like they always come about here. So, so you'll see as, the, uh, as we have these types of structures, seeing a build over as, as you go through some of these parks, especially some of the older structures, are not uncommon and it also creates some challenges for us because as we're trying to locate some hidden fire and other things uh, we're not going to be able to just poke through from below because we have the the ceiling above us there and and, uh, and the uh, aluminum and other things which may make some make some challenges for us to be able to get access uh, into that ceiling system into that roof system paul you have any thoughts on that one yet okay so so just be aware of this you as you as you if you see that we have a, a roof that looks like it's a different age than the trailer itself that you may have some type of build over, which gives you once again, some challenges as far as potential for, for extension and hidden fire and void spaces that you may not typically have on a uh, residential mobile home uh, structure. So we talk about some of the dangers associated with trailer fires. And this is one that uh, once, and I know that, uh, that I've been to, a, I don't know how many, probably a hundred over my career, I don't know, um, of, of some type of, of trailer fires, but but I understand they're very dangerous and we've had a number of close calls in, in my city where I used to work and in, in, in Mesa as well as other cities around us here. And just a very limited research, uh, I've been able to come up with at least eight near misses and trailers in the last 10 years here throughout the valley and, uh, through, and Tucson and, and Northwest Fire District when I just typed in some of the close calls and near misses that we've had and did a little research. So, 
So understand if you do the math, I would guess at least in, in the East Valley here, that we probably had as many near misses and trailers as we have in residential structures. And they're 10% of our, of our may, may at most probably 10% of our structures out there. So I would tell you, don't downplay or, 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 or uh, not be concerned about uh, responding to trailer fires because it can be very dangerous and, and the conditions can change very rapidly if we're not careful. A couple things we'll talk, we're gonna run through this very quickly, but just uh, come, it may come into play as we talk about discussion on, on fighting fires and, and trailers and some of the challenges we have. Uh, these are Don Abbott's uh, 16 trigger phrases for uh, prior to that occurred often on the radio prior to a mayday. And you may have seen these before, but we'll kind of go through them very quickly and just discuss some of the challenges we have and, and some of the problems. So the first one we have is that they talk about is we have zero visibility conditions. And in a trailer, it takes a very small fire to create zero visibility conditions in a trailer. And we know that. Obviously, it, it's such a small space. It may be anywhere from, well, certainly a, uh, an RV can be uh, you know, as small as 200 feet, uh, you know, maybe 1,500 square feet in a, in a double or triple wide or, or manufactured home. But having zero visibility conditions is not unusual in a trailer. And that's not, we operate in zero visibility conditions all the time. But, uh, but once again, in, in a lot of residences, they're large enough where you may be able to have some visibility at the floor level. But in a trailer, not unusual to have zero visibility um, on every situation. So once again, creates a little bit of a red flag for us because our ability to get in and out and, and determine what's going on above our heads or, or someplace else, the fire development may be limited. So we have fire above our heads. Once again, not unusual for us. But, but just the, if, if somebody can mute your mic out, out there, it'd be great. But just understand we have uh, we can have fire above our heads and, and we have rollover and, and flashover in trailers it can happen at a much uh, faster and greater rate than we have on a regular residential structure. Not only due to some of the building materials involved, but just the small spaces. Uh, flow paths in the trailers can be developed, can develop very quickly if something goes wrong. Fire below us uh, in most of our residential structures, uh, we don't have basins. Uh, in tra almost every trailer we're gonna go to, we have at least a void space below the floor. Now, you're not going to fall into a 10-foot basement or something of that nature, but certainly if you fall through the floor and the, the, the 24 inches or 30 inches in some of these structures that you might fall through can not only make it unstable for us to get in and out, but you certainly could have an injury or somebody stuck in there or fall through and as things deteriorate and have difficulty uh, either getting them out or, or something before somebody possibly gets hurt or, or, or worse. We need more line to reach the fire, extend our line. Probably not going to have this a whole lot in trailer fires. It could occur, obviously. I think you may have more challenges based upon layout and based upon additions as far as being able to get the line you need into the right portion of the trailer. But typically, we don't have setbacks that are, that are great in, in our trailer parks to the point where we can't get a hand line to each end of the trailer if necessary. We have not found the seat of the fire. This is not unusual. And you'd think, how can you not find the seat of a fire in a in an 1,100 square foot trailer? But it's not uncommon at all. I know I was listening to some radio traffic of a of a fire that occurred in Mace here just not too long ago that we were at the one hour mark inside of a trailer and still working on finding hot spots and other things. Not unusual for us. I mean, this is, you, you think to yourself, man, you think we'd be able to fill this thing up with water from top to bottom at one hour, and, but we, they're, these, these are challenging. They're, they're trying to find, we can have lots of void spaces, lots of little, little hidden fires potentially, and, and so it may be a challenge for us. So not, not finding the sea of the fire is not that unusual in a trailer fire, so, and could be creating some problems for us. We were running out of air. A low air alarm, that's happened to us as well. I know in the valley here, at least a couple of times that I'm aware of where we've had people run out of air in a, in a, in a trailer trailer fire and, and and not necessarily have a mayday situation, but had difficulty getting in and out of the structure here before they had challenges with their with a low air situation. So once again, we need to monitor our air in a trailer fire just like we do in anything else. And that last third, we need to be outside the structure well before our bell or vibro goes off. This is a hoarder structure. And I'll show you some pictures of a trailer that Mesa had a little while back here, a hoarding uh, structure, but this is not unusual as well. Uh, because of a situation that we have with a, with a lot of trailers, trailers are relatively small. And if you're like me, you have a lot of stuff and there's not a lot of places to put it in a trailer. That's why you'll see them storing things underneath the trailer. You'll see them, that's why they build sheds uh, or additions onto these trailers and stuff so they can have room to store all the things that they have. Um, so a hoarding structure is not unusual, or at least a lot of stuff in a trailer is not unusual, which obviously creates some problems for us as far as fire load, ex uh, extension of fire, difficulty finding the seat of the fire, and other things associated with that. We've had a flashover. Flashovers occur on a regular basis in, in trailers, just once again, partially due to the, uh, the situation of the paneling, lightweight paneling, the uh, the materials, the, certainly the, the fire load inside a structure, but, but you also have 
flow paths challenges, flow path challenges in trailers that are a little more unique than they are in residential structures. And as we get to that point of the, the lecture, we'll talk more about that. We've had a ceiling and roof collapse. We do have collapses in trailers, and I've got a couple pictures to show you, but typically they aren't the type of collapses that people are trapped under and can't get out from under with, uh, without a little bit of uh, additional work. We still want to be aware of that. We need to be aware of all the, the uh, awnings and other things uh, the associated with these trailers, but and I know I was a, a structure fire, we probably probably shouldn't have been inside, but I know we literally had the roof of the trailer because the walls burned out and the uh, lightweight aluminum walls and the um, lightweight and, and small dimension lumber, the, the roof over the master bedroom actually collapsed on one of our crews. Now it wasn't a big deal, they just pushed it up and came out from underneath it, but it, it is a potential problem for us and a collapse and entanglement hazard for us. We have lost multiple windows and trailer fires losing a window or a sliding glass door can be devastating. Uh, the, 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 especially if we have any, any wind at all, any wind driven conditions, but the flow paths that are created in trailers, if we, somebody takes out a window, a window fails, or somebody opens a door a window can really dramatically change the flow paths in a trailer within a few seconds. And we'll talk a little bit about of a near miss we had in Tempe. Uh, that occurred here when, uh, in, I think, about 2018 or something like that. But anyway, th conditions changed in probably less than 10 seconds. Uh, and, and that's very quick, obviously, if you've been working in a trailer for 10 or 15 minutes, 10 seconds is very quick as far as changing from offensive to a defensive conditions. It's uh, really getting hot in here. We are backing out. Once again, not unusual in trailer fires. Uh, because of their con the, the construction, because of the size, uh, and early failure of the windows or doors. A lot of times when we get to these structures, we have we don't have a vent limited structure as compared to residential, regular residential structures. Most of the time we have a working fire with either fire out the doors, windows, or all doors and windows when we get there. But not unusual for us to have a situation where conditions can change, where our crews were inside operating in zero visibility conditions, and they call you back and say, hey, things are deteriorating in here. It's getting really hot. We're backing out. Just understand that that may be a precursor for a mayday situation. Our exit has been blocked. Uh, this may occur not so much from, uh, you know, whereas like in a commercial structure or something like that, where there's materials in front of the door or the door is locked or something, but this may be a challenge for us because of the layout of the structures and additions and other things. If somebody can uh, mute your mic, I'm not sure who that may be, but if you guys have an open mic, if you'll mute that for us, that'd be great. Um, but, but understand that uh, our exits could be blocked somewhat easily with, and sometimes the exit may be blocked with, uh, with firefighters. Uh, for any of you that have been to uh, many trailer fires, sometimes command, and I've been guilty of this myself, will send 12 people into a single wide trailer and all you can hear inside is bell, er, our bottles clanking together because we've got you know, 12 people in a, in a 600 square foot area and that doesn't work out so well as far as being able to get in and out, obviously, if things go wrong. So sometimes it may be blocked with actual personnel inside there because trying to think, think you're gonna get two firefighters to be able to pass each other on their knees in a hallway of a single wide trailer is almost virtually impossible. We are sending a firefighter out with a problem. Uh, this can be a challenge for us on any incident we have. If we're in a zero visibility situation, uh, obviously trailers in, in a standard layout of a trailer may be relatively easy to get in and out of uh, because they're not very wide or very deep, or they may be deep but not very wide. But just understand that we still may have a situation where we get somebody disoriented uh, as they're going out and may go the wrong direction or whatever and have difficulty exiting the structure. Hole in the floor, had floor collapse. The hole in the floor is not unusual. I, I would bet probably on any of my working, uh, uh, significant working fires that we had at least some floor uh, compromise on probably I'd say 25% at least uh, if we've had a significant fire. So that's not unusual for us. And, and I've had a number of situations where people have fallen through the floor, not to the, to the point of being injured, but having a, a floor of this compromise where they had to either advise command that the, that the floor was, was compromised in a certain portion of the trailer. So we need to be aware of that. Command has lost communications with multiple units. Uh, that can happen in any situation, whether somebody's radio gets bumped to the wrong channel, whether it's a, a situation where they've got the radio in their, in their pocket or, or just in a, that they may not hear what's going on and may not certainly understand or, or may miss a, a radio transmission inside of a trailer. So that can happen in any situation. We typically don't have sprinkler heads going off in, in trailer fire, so that's not really one we have to fight, face most of the time. So these are a couple of incidents that occurred in, in Mesa a few years back. I think it was 18 or 19, somewhere a few years back. But just they had a, an after action report on these and you'll see just a couple of comments that uh, I won't spend a whole lot of time on these, but just to reinforce what we just talked about. 
In one of the incidents they had, there's some radio traffic that talked about no visibility, that the fire was below them, they can't make access to the fire, and that temperature increased dramatically in seconds. So you'll see there that they had four of the 16 uh, near miss, or the, sorry, the Mayday uh, reported uh, factors involved in that incident they had there on the first one. They had an unplanned ventilation action that resulted in a hostile fire event. Uh, this is the, the, the trip first trailer they had. And my understanding was at least the portions that I've, I've seen here, they had problems with the fire in the storage shed that extended into the residence as, as crews came in behind them. I think it created a flow path where it allowed the, the fire be, them to be, get between the fire and the exhaust port, which, which then, uh, if you can see the front there, um, put our firefighters in jeopardy. Second incident they had, there's some comments that were made on the radio though. They had smoke all the way to the floor. The fire's below the main room. We we're having trouble finding the seat of the fire. We have high heat and we're exiting the structure. So once again, five trigger phrases on the radio that, uh, that are typically found in, in near miss or mayday situations. So not unusual for us to have that. Unplanned event resulted in a hostile fire. The mobile home well. fire on the south side became too dangerous. So one fire actually had to make a very rare call. Right, nine on your side's Veronica Vernaccio first brought you the story last week. And now she spoke to the man who made the mayday call that made the difference between life and death. It started with a call about a trailer on fire. Dispatch came on and said there's still possibly a child trapped in the trailer. Garland Paris and his two men arrived on the scene and went in for the child. Two of them went in the back towards the bedrooms while Paris was in the living room. That's when the fire heated up. Ceiling was rolled with fire uh, and the smoke and the heat banked down and then it put, pushed me down to the floor so I was on my knees. Never seen a fire roll as fast as this one did. His biggest worry? his teammates. I was sitting there, I was watching this fire. It was, uh, it was getting really involved up there. And the last thing I wanted to do was to flash down the hallway where they were at. But he knew he couldn't get them out alone. And if I ran down the hallway, as hot as that got, and as fast as that happened, I'd get flashed on. And then we'd be more in a world of hurt because nobody knew where I was at, but I knew where my firefighters were at. When I got on the radio and called for them, they didn't hear me. I went ahead and at that point I called the May Day. That's something he has never had to do. In his 21 years as a firefighter, it was shocking for the crews that heard it. The adrenaline surge that everybody hears on that uh, fire ground when they think that one of their coworkers is in imminent danger, you, 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 you have a hard time putting that into words, what it does to you emotionally. It's a whole different mindset for communications, for command, for the firefighters that are on the on the fire ground, that when a mayday's called, that means one of us is in there, one of us is hurt, one of us is trapped. A mayday call means a firefighter is inside and needs help. At the end of the day, we try to save people, but we want to go home safely as well. It took 45 seconds for Paris and his two men to get out. Everyone got out safely because he says the mayday call saved their lives. Veronica Vernaccio, KGA 9, on your side. So that was a close call that, uh, that occurred in Tucson here. And, and one of the things you probably picked up that, uh, that they had there was uh, that he found himself separated from his crew members when conditions deteriorated and, and wasn't able to get access to his crew members. And just a reminder from that perspective as well, we recently had a couple of incidents in Mesa that were, uh, I wouldn't, well, I would probably call them close calls here a little bit. And it seemed like in one of the common denominators we found not only in Mesa, but in some of the other East Valley cities and some of our incidents that have occurred, in, including the May Day that occurred in Tempe here, is the company officer getting separated from the firefighters. Uh, we, we talk about that, you know, we always talk about maintaining contact or verbal contact, at least with our crew members and, or physical contact as we're in limited visibility environments or any IDLH. Um, but I'm not sure what's causing this. Uh, I, I don't know if it happens all the time and we just get caught occasionally. Uh, but I would tell you, we need to be very careful about getting separated from our crew members where we're not in contact with them or, or directly and in, in within uh, a reasonable reach of them uh, in case things go wrong. Uh, like I say, we had several situations where, where firefighters were separated out and, and things went wrong and then trying to recover your firefighters, even if you're 20 or 30 feet away and zero visibility can create some serious problems for us as far as uh, a mayday situation or, or our ability to locate and have accountability for our people. So if I could just really reinforce to you that I know there's situations where you're shagging hose or or you have to be separated for a second as you're maybe doing a tick directed search, but you're still within, you know, within certainly verbal contact of your firefighters and other things that are going on. But just use caution about getting too far separated between our firefighters and, and our company officers because we're there and we, we certainly don't want anybody ever operating alone. We always operate in pairs. 
Um, so please do what you can to make uh, to, to shorten up those distances we have between our firefighters and our and our company officers and, and when we're operating in the IDLH just to prevent these things from happening. Uh, I'll give you a real quick story time with with Pat here on the Tempe incident we had a couple of years ago. A single wide trailer uh, had an addition to it. Uh, fire came out. It's a 400 West Baseline mobile home park. I happened to be at the station that was first due uh, visiting the crew, so got there at the same time that the the first due crew did. Uh, working fire in uh, one end of the structure, we had some smoke and, and fire showing from. Uh, one end of the structure, we laid a supply line in, pulled an inch and three quarter to the interior. We actually pulled two lines to the interior for search, rescue, fire attack. Things looked like they were going pretty good. I mean, to the point where I figured we'd be smoking and joking and telling stories in about five minutes after everything went out and noticed that conditions changed. And probably, like I say, when I say it's less than 10 seconds, it went from having some brown smoke, pressurized brown smoke to pressurized turbulent black smoke in probably less than 10 seconds. And it was one of those where I was feeling pretty good. The reports we were getting back were actually pretty good. Uh, and then the, one of the reports I hear from one of the crews is, hey, we've got the conditions are deteriorating. Uh, it's getting really hot in here. And I kind of did one of those, what? What did he say? Did kind of you know, just wasn't sure what he said. And, and then the next one you hear kind of the screaming, hey, we got to get out. And that's literally what the, tr the, the, the radio transmission is. We got to get out. And so we called emergency traffic, evacuate the structure. Everybody came out of the, the structure pretty quickly. But the crew members inside said, hey, they had smoke at about the, maybe the, the three foot level inside here, brown smoke, but, but you know, it was some visibility inside the structure. And they said it went from brown smoke to zero visibility, black, jet black, high heat conditions in less than 10 seconds. They said it literally drove them to the floor within 10 seconds and, and literally they said they, they were lucky to get out. They, they, and what had happened is we had a window fail in one of the structure and we had just a light wind, maybe a five or 10 mile an hour wind but created a flow path now that uh, they were in the, the exhaust port basically between the, the, the window with the wind and the uh, exit, uh, the large uh, um, sliding glass door was open and they happened to be in between there. And they, so we had a real near, near miss for an incident that I thought, once again, we hate to say routine, but what I thought was gonna be a, a pretty simple fire with, we had pretty pretty good crews and and very aggressive crews and stuff that, uh, that I was feeling very confident when we got there that we would be literally back finishing up breakfast here within a few minutes and, and we literally left lucky nobody got hurt. Um, so please don't hesitate to, I mean, don't underestimate trailer fires. They can go wrong very quickly and be very deadly as associated with that as well. So we're gonna shift gears just a little bit now to RV fires and we'll talk some about that and we'll, then we're gonna do some overall fire discussion as far as our fire attack and other things. But RV fires can create, can, can create some additional challenges for us as well. And these are somewhat common. Uh, if you get online, there's about 10 million of them online videos of them, but so so it's not unusual for us to find these. Some of the basics there, you'll see that uh, RVs are, are built somewhat like the old pre-76 trailers. Uh, typically some kind of metal frame, I-beam frame of some kind, got some lightweight flooring, uh, lightweight structural members, uh, aluminum skin on the outside of most of these things. So they're very flimsy. I know uh, a couple of years back, I was looking at uh, possibly getting a, a trailer and, and went out to one of the RV shows and and man, just walking around in one of the, I mean, and they're expensive to start off with, but walking around in these things, they're flimsy. They're, they're lightweight, they've got the lightweight paneling, they've got lightweight floors. Everything about them seems cheap other than the cost. Uh, and they, uh, they, they just are not very well built. And this, is, and this is new ones. Now, some of the older ones, and if you happen to have the money to be able to buy a, 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 a what's the stream of trailers? The, anyway, the, the, nicer, the nicer ones there, what was it again? Airstream. Airstream, that's the one I'm thinking of, the Airstream trailers. If you happen to have $200,000 to buy an Airstream trailer, then you have a little better construction. But, but this is what you see here. You got lightweight uh, construction. You have, uh, now they have, certainly all the trailers that are out there now have slide outs and other things, which create some additional areas for you to search or, or fire extension. But typically gonna be small dimension lumbers. Uh, we understand just about every one of these will have some type of propane storage tank somewhere in the, the structure itself. You got the aluminum covering over the outside and, and typically not unusual to have once again early floor failure on these structures as well. So, so you can see here just some of the construction of, of trailers here. Uh, some of them have some aluminum uh, structural members, other ones utilize the uh, uh, two by two or, or something of that nature, but very lightweight uh, construction on these. So early failure is not unusual and certainly should be expected. Some of, if you get into some of the uh, diesel pushers, the gas uh, gas powered models, obviously there's there's trailers which uh, are, are to be designed to be towed. And then you have gas and, and diesel pushers that uh, that obviously have a motor and, and the ability to be driven wherever they go. Um, 
the the cost of some of these, as you you well know, and we'll see some here in a second, are, are astronomical. Uh, they've got, I know, some of the, the the one down there in the bottom, like I say, 1.7 million dollars for a stinking trailer. I mean, for a for a uh, travel trailer, an RV, if you want to call it that. And the one in the top left, I think, was like 1.8 or some kind of crazy number. So these are not unusual. The cost of some of these things are they're amazing inside. I know I walked through a few of them at the uh, RV show. I mean, it's marble countertops and, and incredible designs and stuff, but just uh, it's a very expensive. So you may have a, a, a larger fire loss on one of these RVs in, than some of your residential structures we have. It wouldn't be unusual at all either. So but we also look at that and, and you can see here uh, there's you know the fire load in some of these structures can be pretty significant as well so we have a couple different types of rv fires you may either have them parked around the road which is the, with either a gas or diesel powered and you have the towable towable version which may be either parked stored or being towed when the fire occurs so so there's a number of situations we can have with rv fires that uh, that can create some uh, and, and in each situation can create some challenges for us, uh, depending on where they're located or, or what the situation is. So on the road, obviously the, some of the challenges we have there as far as our folks operating in the road, trying to extinguish a fire that uh, we may not be close to a water source, uh, trying to put out a, a, a significant size motorhome fire uh, may require a couple of units. Uh, you may have to either shuttle water or, or lay a supply line in for some of our larger RVs. Uh, but you have the challenges just like we do any other vehicle incident that we're having operating in the road where where other drivers bec become a hazard for our firefighters and i'll show you an incident about that in just a second uh, then we also have those same rvs and trailers that are that are located in parks so in some situations depending on the type of park you may have uh, rvs i mean yeah rvs and trailers the portable trailers parked next to mobile homes and manufactured homes just the next slot over. So you can have those commingled as well. So it can create some challenges for us as far as exposures and extension and things of that nature. So be careful if you're on the hill and you're working in the street with an RV. So the engine just arrived, they're charging, they're pulling a hand line right now. Shit, man. Now we got a man. Shoot, get out of here. Go. Go. Yeah, we got a mess. So as you can see here, obviously oh, that just go. changed the, the dynamics of this incident there very quickly because uh, they obviously didn't uh, certainly know what they had, but certainly changes the operation as far as put something under the tire. They did that a little bit Sir, earlier, but put something under the tire. Put something under the tire. Put something under the tire. Now we got us a mess. What are the chances? 100%, of course. <laughs> so just keep that in mind anytime. And this, this goes for vehicle fires as well. I probably have 15 videos of vehicle fires that were on a hill of some type and the fire department starts spraying water on them and then the vehicle starts moving and, and rolling away from them or down a hill or across the freeway or in a number of different situations. And so so just a thought, if, if, we, if we're in a situation like that, certainly chalk the wheels if you're on a hill. So pretty significant fire. This is one of those where obviously you don't want to pull a red line. This is something we want to pull an inch and three quarter to, so that we have sufficient water to, to extinguish the fire and protect our crews. We need to consider approaching uh, RV fires like we do vehicle fires from the corner. Don't park your vehicle too close. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes with some other videos here. But don't park too close. Something bitching on the roof here.
So I'm not sure what that is there. I know it looks like it's coming out near the AC unit, so I'm not sure if it's something venting out of uh, one of the pressurized lines there, or but we have, it's not unusual to have uh, uh, propane leaks as well from the, uh, the safety valves going off and from the propane tanks as well. So just as you can see here, obviously we're uh, an inch and three quarter can, can extinguish these fires, but they, but also understand they can be very difficult. I know I've had a couple of these on the freeway, which is the worst place in the world, obviously, to have an RV fire because trying to get a supply line for, for something like this is, is very challenging on the freeway. So I know we, we've used a, a three engine shuttle on, on a large RV that, that was had just significant problems as far as the, uh, uh, the deep seated fire that we just couldn't get out. So just understand that not unusual for crews to call for a three and one on, on a significant size RV or, or certainly another additional unit on these these types of vehicles just because of the challenges and, and not only extinguishing the fire, getting it all clear and having sufficient water to, to, to uh, put the fire out. As I can tell you from experience, it's pretty embarrassing when you uh, you run out of water and, and now you have to take the engine or wait for another engine to get there with an additional tank of water as the, as the vehicle starts burning even more. So understand that RV fires can be dangerous as well, even though they're very small. You still have the potential for a flashover inside these and extremely high, con high heat conditions. And, and in this situation, there was a California firefighter burned uh, by an RV fire. And once again, as we talked about before, and some of these RVs are significant size. They're, I mean, they're, they're almost as big as some of our small single wide trailers. So don't downplay the dangers associated with it. If you have a significant size trailer of any kind, that you can't reach the whole trailer from basically the doorway, you probably ought to consider getting at least another unit coming, if not a, a, a three and one to, to make sure you have sufficient resources and crews if something goes wrong in the ability to, to extinguish the fire. So be careful also fighting fires in the street. And this is a situation here where I think it's LA City or somewhere, I'm not sure. But I think this car that just drives through here either clips this firefighter or hits the supply line that jerks the jerks the supply line and, and yanks his uh, legs out from under him. But kind of interesting, the, the well, I was just going to say that the lack of concern here is pretty interesting. This guy finishes his, <laughs> finishes his supply line <laughs> as the firefighter's laying on the street. I was a little, a little shocked to see that one. I'm not sure exactly the situation, but. <laughs> so he had to get the supply line and nothing stops him from getting the supply line. Uh, but the firefighter does okay. That, that later in the video, he's actually getting in an ambulance and got his shirt off and looking at some of the bruises and stuff. But, but just just uh, understand. <laughs> but just as as we talked about before, just understand that uh, you know this is this is a situation just like any time we're working on the street, whether it be a vehicle accident or a car pedestrian or something else, that we have to watch for the uh, other the other vehicles around us. This is one where we use our apparatus to to block the road if necessary. We call for PD to shut down the road if we need to, um, but just understand, obviously, the smoke coming off of some of these can, can be significant, which can certainly obscure the vision of the drivers, uh, and they may not see you operating in, in, in the roadway on a situation like this and, and may get yourself in a situation where you may get uh, put your firefighters at risk. Uh, and, and, then, and you can see this knucklehead here, for some reason, decided not to use this SCBA as well. So certainly we don't do that in, in, in the East Valley here, and we should never uh, work on any fire of any kind without an SCBA. And then we talked about before, consider if uh, you've got a significant size uh, RV, uh, I would consider laying a supply line coming in. You'll wish you did, uh, just so you don't have to shuttle water and, and, and you may be able to extinguish the fire with, with one crew versus multiple crews and may be able to use your, your deck gun if necessary as well. So we talked about parking too close, just be careful. Talk about attacking from the corners also. So, you know, things uh, the, with between the propane tanks and other things, we can have concerns and and certainly uh, blevies or other situations if we have a, a tank rupture or, or something of that nature, which can cause a, a significant fireball. So we want to make sure we're not parked uh, too close where our apparatus becomes endangered and then obviously consider uh, attacking the fire from the corners. 
Uh, conducting a primary search also. We don't think about that maybe a lot with RVs, but here's a situation where they're pulling somebody out of an RV that's somewhat well involved. You wonder how they didn't get out early in the process, but they didn't. And then you have people trying to put the fire out as well. So, so we need to conduct a primary search on any vehicle we find like that where we have livable space. Uh, it's not unusual for us to find, uh, I know over the last few years here, uh, in East Valley, I know there've probably been at least three or four people, the victims that have been pulled out or, or found uh, uh, a deceased uh, following the uh, search of, a, of an RV or trailer, certainly. This one's unique. Just we talk about the storage of trailers. This is one that got a trailer fire burning between a couple of houses. And this one, they had a helicopter do a water drop. I don't know for sure why, but I thought it was a good idea on That's top of the, the fireman. Time he did it. Missed it. He got the, water, the, the fire department. Oh, shit. So kind of a big hot mess. Oh, you got man. the trailer burning. You got uh, a helicopter side and do a water drop Let's on a miss and hit the fireman. Uh, you got a, a propane tank uh, vent, uh, safety vent going off here as well here. So just kind of a big hot mess and a dangerous situation on a stored trailer. This is a uh, one of the smaller RV units at a getting a, a propane tank refilled. So you can see there that had a little bit of a vent, cruiser parked a little bit closer probably than they, they wanted to be. They got a little pucker factor. So the guy had his pack on. I don't know if he had his mask on or not, but he ran pretty quickly. So I'm not sure if that was just because of the fireball or he wasn't quite as prepared as he should have been. Engineer locked himself out of the truck. You always love that when that happens. I always hate it when they got it on camera too. Dang it. So this is kind of a unique situation, obviously, where you got a fire in the RV next to a giant propane tank filling station. So just that press position can be a, a challenge for us. Don't park too close. Back to that breaking news, a massive fire in Abbotsford at an RV business. Police encouraging people to stay inside with the potential that this smoke could be toxic. Let's go right back up to Amber Belter and our Global One chopper. Amber, we believe this is Fraser Way RV. That's the name of the business. What's the latest? That is true. Yes, it is Fraser Way RV Park. You can see that uh, the sign here on a couple of containers. Uh, this is just off of Highway 1. Uh, right by Whatcom Road. Now, Whatcom Road exit off of Highway 1 is blue. So this is a situation, I think they've got, they've burned over 100 trailers here, or 100 RVs. Uh, almost Fox, this is right almost in the a $10 million area, fire loss. Uh, between Sumas and uh, Chilliwack, so that's been flooded. That's not where the fire is, the flow up in flames, flames heavy. Now, this is certainly a unique situation because you can see here, this is all flood water. So they're, they actually can't really get to, to the area to put this out. This is flood waters here, this is a flood water. So this is the road that the fire trucks are on, they really can't even get across here to try to put this out. But certainly a unique situation, but not unusual to see trailers and, and RVs parked like this. I know when I used to come home on the freeway on the 60 at uh, Mesa Drive there, and the Camping World, I'm not sure which one it is, but every now and then when they had an RV show going on, I swear there's a thousand RVs and that stuff in that one parking lot. I always thought, man, if that thing ever catches fire, that would, I mean, it, it would be like, millions of dollars in fire loss here for for RV, so not unusual, but but you know you look at our city as well, and just about any city out there, you know we've got you know little deal, little prices. We've got the uh, La Mesa RV. If you look at there, you know not unusual that we would we could potentially have a a fire in an RV that extended, whether it's because of a, a burglary issue or something else or a mechanical issue, but you could have multiple trailers or RVs burning at the same time and have some difficulty and challenges. Uh, trying to extinguish those as well. So just some things to think about as you pre-plan your area, your first two areas, some things that uh, may be some challenges for us as far as our ability to, to extinguish fires in these locations. Just some things to think about. If you have a situation like that, consider laying multiple supply lines and trying to find good cutoff locations. If it happens to be a business where you actually have somebody there and it's, it's working hours, I would consider seeing if you can get somebody with a set of keys or a bunch of keys to start uh, creating a fire break for you. And, and certainly I would write off a few trailers or, or RVs, go down a few and, and start moving a few. If you have the ability to do that, to create a fire break that you might have the ability to, to, to stop the uh, fire spread. 
consider using obviously master streams, portable monitors, two and a half inch hand lines, obviously big, big water for something like this to try to cut things off. Be careful about positioning fire apparatus between narrow rows and becoming an exposure. Uh, you know, it's not quite as bad as a stick farm situation, but certainly if you have some wind driven conditions, uh, if you happen to place your apparatus between, you know, a lot of these uh, roadways, if you've been looking at RVs, which I have in the past, you know, a lot of times they're only 20 feet wide or less. And so a little bit of wind and, and you know, six or eight RVs burning at the same time could certainly put our, our apparatus uh, in a situation where they could be an exposure and have to be moved or, or damaged as a result of it. So we'll briefly talk, we're about ready to take a break here in just a second, but we'll talk briefly about fi fixed fire ground factors. Obviously, uh, trailers are not quite as complex as our residential structures as far as their types of constructions and some of the fixed fire ground factors. Well, building construction, we know they're very lightweight uh, and, and typically the, you know, they have lightweight flooring that fails early. They have lightweight siding, which fails early. Um, there's typically minimal attic space, but there is a void space certainly below the floor. So we know the building construction on these occupancy. Typically, uh, as we know that there's, and, and I would tell you, don't underestimate the number of people that can live in a trailer. I know we've had incidents where we've been to medical calls in some of these situations where you've got 12 people or something living in a single white trailer and you think, no freaking way. But, you know, in certain situations, that just, that's just what happens. Uh, so we talk about occupancy as well. And, just, and this is just something that, you know, just if you do the math and, and I've read articles and stuff about this kind of associated with as well that, you know, a lot of people that live in RVs or, or trailers are living there because their social economic status is just not the best. I mean, otherwise, they'd probably be living in a home if they could. Um, so, and, and as we also know that some of the factors associated with that with socioeconomic issues sometimes are, are drugs and alcohol and things, which then sometimes impairs their ability to get in and out of a trailer if things go wrong. Uh, so just understand that, you know, that, that there's some things associated with RVs and trailers that, that may in, increase the, the potential for, for victims inside these structures that you might not have necessarily in a regular residential structure. Arrangement exposure, we'll talk more about that in a second when we talk about the, the placement of trailers and, and stuff, but certainly trailer fires uh, and on the roadway, maybe a little bit less as far as exposures go, but certainly in trailer parks, uh, not unusual at all for us to pull up and with the trailer fire and have uh, either one or more other trailers that are either on, uh, direct exposures or already on fire. Fire and smoke conditions, obviously that varies depending on the incident, life hazards, we've talked about that. Resources, the, the challenge typically with resources is getting them in there. We, in most of these valleys, we certainly have plenty of resources to manage any trailer fire that may be taking place. The challenge is when you got a 18 foot wide roadway and somebody's put a couple of vehicles on either side and, and trying to get our apparatus in there, and then whether or not we have a supply or a hydrant available to us, and then laying a supply line into these structures, is the, the challenge with resources there a lot of times is just getting more than one unit anywhere near the trailer that's involved, or trailers involved. Actions are typically not going to be a challenge for us. We typically will have our crews and, and command officers are, are, are pretty dialed in on what we need to do. And then special circumstances, certainly wind and, and other factors, uh, environmental factors may become an issue for us with trailer fires as far as flow paths and other things. Response considerations, just understand that uh, that anytime you have, uh, you get dispatched to a trailer fire and if you leave the, the, the uh, station or if you're out on the road and, and you see a significant column of smoke, uh, go ahead and make sure that we upgrade to a, to a, a working fire situation. Um, that way it gets us the proper resources coming as far as PD and, and for traffic control and, and a utility truck and ambulance and other things that we have there, at least on the scene. And then if you get reports of multiple trailers on fire, uh, you know, consider bumping it to a first if we need to, because I can tell you that uh, it's not unusual if you have multiple trailers on fire to utilize uh, all of a first alarm as far as getting access and hydrants and and apparatus and, and stuff to, to address multiple trailers that may be burning. Supply line, yes, no, maybe. This is a big one and, and this is a, a significant challenge for us even more so than in residential structures based upon the layout of these trailer parks. So I would tell you, and, and this one's gonna be gonna take some, uh, this is where you may earn your money as a company officer is whether or not, how you're gonna lay a supply line, where you're gonna come, where are you gonna lay it from, other apparatus approaching all of those things come into play here as we talk about supply lines, because with trailer parks, a lot of times you get one shot bringing the supply line in and then you may or may not have access to it again. Uh, you get a limited number of apparatus, may be able to get access to the, to the front of the structure or near the structure for fire attack. So, but I would tell you, if you have a working, if you have a working fire, getting a supply line will definitely make things better. Cause I can, from experience once again, having a situation where you come in on tank water, expecting the supply line to get there uh, can really put us behind the curve when uh, when that doesn't occur as we think it may. Um, 
Careful attention should always be paid to these, these incidents to make sure we lay the supply line on one side of the street. We don't have a lot of room in a lot of these trailer parks. Some of them, they don't allow parking on the street. Others, they allow street parking and certainly depending on the hour of the day. During the day, you're probably gonna have less vehicles in the roadway than you will certainly at night. But if you try to gain access to a lot of these trailer parks and other things at night, you're gonna find very difficult to get more than one apparatus or one width of an apparatus through there. And laying a supply line can certainly block that access for other people. But in a lot of our parks, and we'll show you some maps here in a second, there's typically a second way to get around a lot of these parks here that it's not necessarily just a one way in, one way out situation where it allows us other opportunities to get uh, around the other side on some of these situations. Understand that uh, another big challenge we have with some of our uh, mobile home parks throughout the valley here is a lack of hydrants. Uh, in, our, in our best situation, we have hydrants every 500 feet, but there's a number of uh, trailer parks and RV parks in the East Valley here that have no hydrants at all. Uh, and so, and then also understand that a lot of these trailer parks are private property. So once again, whether the hydrants have been maintained the way we need or want them to be, and whether or not they have sufficient uh, uh, flow capacity is another challenge that we may find in some of our older parks that maybe have been grandfathered in. So just understand that location and capacity could be a challenge for us as, uh, as the infamous uh, Paul Liddell has said here, a water supply is the foundation of every successful fire ground operation. And I believe it truly uh, is, is, uh, makes a difference for us as far as our setting ourselves up for success. Supply lines and at ladder access. If you happen to arrive at a trailer park or, or the park at the same time as a ladder company, consider allowing the ladder to come in first uh, because once again, once we lay that supply line, it may block access for any additional vehicles or apparatus that may be able to get into that location or from that side. So if you happen to arrive at the same time, uh, try to get, let the ladder go in first and then they can get some uh, position necessary that uh, for whether it be for search and rescue, for uh, forcible entry, whether it be for in certain situations, if we have wind driven conditions, it may even be for aerial operations. Establishing a supply line, you can see here just a, a little graphic just showing you. Obviously, if you can, try to lay down one side of the uh, the road and then and then and then attach to your apparatus. So we have the ability to get other apparatus in. Uh, there's a lot of times, unfortunately, with just the, the width of the road only allows one apparatus and one supply line, and it just it's not going to allow other other vehicles coming from that location. So just understand once again that may be the only piece of apparatus that gives gates access to the scene if we lay down the middle of the road. Split lay supply lines. And this is one that we have some challenges in a few of our trailer parks, certainly in Mesa. I know we used to in Tempe and Scottsdale and other, other locations that may have problems with, uh, with uh, hydrant, or hydrant locations that are absent in some of our trailer parks and access and, and long hose lays. If you, hopefully, if you have uh, trailer parks and, and mobile home parks in your first two area that you've done some pre-planning to determine whether or not you have any situation where, where you're, uh, your hose bed won't allow you to lay a single supply line in from the nearest hydrant to any portion of the of the park. If that's the situation, then you need to understand a couple of options as far as a split lay goes, as far as being able to determine a, uh, the ability to, to provide a supply line within a reasonable amount of time. And we talk about this and it sounds simple, but doing a split lay is gonna probably add another five minutes to at least three or four minutes to the, uh, to the uh, securing a supply line. And, and, and with a lightweight, trailer and if, it, if you have any wind at all blowing it you may have multiple trailers burning by the time you get a, a supply line in on a split lay operation so a couple of options you may have that you can do there's i'm sure there's a number of plans that you may have and if you've worked something out with your department your other nearby stations the other engine in your station whatever it may be utilize whatever is appropriate but just think about the different options you would have and a couple of them are the, are the ones we have here uh, in certain situations, it may make sense for the first two pumper to lay their supply line in from the hydrant until the hose bed runs out. And then they, they continue to the fire and work off of tank water. The second engine picks up the hose lay from where the initial pumper supply line ended up, lays it in from that location to the forward company and uh, pumper and completes the hose lay. That's one option. The second option, if you're very familiar with your trailer park and you know that, hey, if I start laying it from here, I can reach the back corner of the park, which is, of course, Murphy's Law where the fire will be that if I start laying in from this location, that I'll lay in, uh, just drop my uh, full and firefighter and the supply line at the middle of the park, keep it to one side, lay into the, uh, to the, to the uh, trailer fire itself, work off of, of, of tank water, and the second company, engine company, lays in from the hydrant to the end of your supply line, connects at that location, and then pumps the forward supply line, uh, pumps the forward pumper with that supply line. 
So that's two options. I'm sure there's multiple other, other I know there's the, the situations where you may reverse out and things of that nature. So I know there's a number of other options that may occur. But the big thing we want you to understand is just that if you have a situation, be familiar not only with your trailer park, uh, that whether or not you have access of, of hydrants and access and, and where you may need a, a situation with split lay, but also communicate and, and maybe even uh, practice uh, doing a split lay with other companies so that if this occurs, you can get a water supply within the first 10 minutes of an incident. So you can see here if on some of these uh, these trailer parks that we have shown here, uh, the, there's no hydrants at all in that park here that I'm looking at here, the, at least in, unless they've been added here. The only hydrants I see are at the entrances here. Uh, so if you had a fire in that back corner, as you see here, my guess is you're going to use a good portion of your of your supply line to get to that back corner. may not be a big challenge for us, but do you know if that's the case? And if it is, the, that's good. If you don't know that, you need to probably go out and do a little driving and do some measuring. The other trailer park you can see here is a little more challenging because you only have, when you get down that end, one way in, one way out. So if you start laying that supply line in from the, that, uh, that out there on Main Street, or we may have challenges not only blocking the entrance, but the remainder of the park. Um, but you may have challenges as far as uh, um, if you were going to run out of the hose line before you get to that back corner. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. Unfortunately, East Deputy just left here, and I was going to have them comment on it, but and I'm not sure if Brian or, or, or somebody else wants to comment, but uh, this is a situation where this is a judgment call. This is where we talk about how company officers have to sometimes earn the money. It may be a judgment call where you have to decide if I don't lay in and I have somebody lay into me, that way I get two engine companies with a supply line near the front of the structure. It gives us some additional options. But understand anytime you bypass the supply line, and you go into a structure with on tank water, that there's always the possibility that you're gonna run out of water before you get the fire knocked down and you get a supply line. So it's a judgment call we have to make and that that fire may extend and, and create some additional challenges for us. So it's a judgment call we have to make. So even though it says on a working fire, we, we should always lay our own and secure our own supply line. Sometimes we have to use our judgment as to whether or not we can see another company that's just down the road that may be in position to bring us that supply line very quickly and not have that delay. So. Uh, uh, Chief Darling, I'm not sure if you want to comment on just your thoughts on whether or not that first company should always lay in or most of the time lay in or just make sure we don't run out of water or do what we need to do. Yeah, like you said, Pat, I, uh, it, it's a judgment call, right? I, I think my first choice would be to bring a supply line in with me. The crews could walk with the additional equipment down there. That way we have a continuous water supply. Um, we shouldn't, in some, I'm looking at the one on the right, the 2207 West Main. I can't imagine we're going to need two pumpers down in that driveway it's going to be really tight so if i can get one pumper with a uh, supply line i'd be happy with that but um like you said there might be a situation looking at the one there on the left if it's going to take a long time to get a supply back there and we can go ahead and effect a rescue then i would understand and and i would support the decision to go in and just do a quick attack and have my second unit bring the supply so it's just you got to communicate that you got to read your CAD comments. You got to use the intel that you have to make those decisions. Outstanding. And I think two things that he mentioned there that we need to make sure and hopefully you heard his comments here, but two things to think about for sure when we have a situation like this is one is a known rescue. If we have a known rescue that uh, all bets are off there, that changes everything from the standpoint of uh, we're probably going to go in and tank water on that situation, see if we can make a, a, a quick direct uh, 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 search and rescue operation that may uh, recover the victim here because obviously in a small trailer, it doesn't take long for, for conditions to deteriorate or become unsurvivable in, 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 a, in a small trailer or, or RV. So certainly a known rescue boost situation where we would certainly uh, be, be comfortable with, uh, with you bypassing the supply line coming in if, if you felt appropriate. Uh, the other thing, once again, is if you have, uh, and, and we talk about each situation is different. If, you, if you're if you approaching a trailer park and there's another company that's also approaching at the same time where we know that that they're, the delay and, and them getting a supply in them would be minimal, that certainly is a, would make would make certainly make sense for, for us to not lay a supply line in and have somebody bring one into us. But just use caution uh, when we don't know where the second due company is and we have no known rescue uh, of just summarily just bypassing hydrants just because uh, um, we, we're going to have somebody else bring us one because that may create some problems for us or challenges for us if we're not careful. Here's a couple of other situations. This is a, 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 a trailer park that's on East Main Street and Main Street and Harris it is here. But just looking at the, the Google Maps, I, I was kind of pulled this one and took a look here. Some significant challenges for us if you look at this here. There's, uh, there's no hydrants in the park itself. There's one out there. It looks like on Harris is the closest one we can see there. 
Um, but some real challenges for us, if you look at the vehicles and, and access here, I mean, those roadways are narrow, those, those trailers are stuffed in there tight. You can see every one of the trailers has a, an addition and a, and a storage room and, and everything else. So some real difficulties for us, potential challenges for us as far as getting a, a supply line to that back corner and getting more than one company back to that corner. Because once again, if you lay in from that front, uh, front hydrant there through that front entrance, you probably have shut off the park for everybody else coming in. Um, so this is one where we might, if we know that we got another company that's coming in very quickly, we go in with tank water, make sure that second company knows that we're going to communicate, as Chief Darling said, we're going to communicate that we do not have a supply line. We need the next company to get us a supply line. Um, and But it, once again, judgment call as to whether or not we think we can be effective with our tank water or whether we need to lay our supply line in and we'll get creative with other uh, resources. So, so for example, this situation here, if 202 comes in, lays their supply line here, we probably just maybe eliminated the uh, additional access to the park with that. Now, once again, we, we can probably support them in that operation because a five inch supply line can, can I think it can feed 45 hand lines. I'm not sure how many it can feed, but a lot, and I'm just kidding, of course. But because uh, typically we had four inch line and then we didn't get so much, but I know I've seen amazing things coming out of large diameter hose, five inch hose can, I have seen, I don't know how, but I've seen literally 15 lines come off a truck and they all work. So, um, but anyway, but just uh, so, but certainly a large diameter supply line does create some challenges for us as far as access. But if we have a situation like this and they decide to lay in, we certainly support them in doing that because that's what volume two talks about. But just understand that we may have some challenges with getting uh, the remainder of crews may have to go work, work in on foot. Now, the other option we have is do we do something like this? Do we bring another company in on the roadway next to it, go through the backyard and go over the fence or knock down the fence? I mean, we, I know a lot of times we see that block wall and go, oh my gosh, it's a block wall. But as we see, anytime we have a monsoon uh, around here, that it blows down 200 feet of block wall in about two seconds. So uh, certainly a, a motivated engine or ladder company could take down a block wall pretty easily. I mean, for the most part, you can just push them over. Uh, they've got the little ladder, uh, I don't know what those things are called, little miniature like rebar looking things that are ladder, uh, the, they look like ladders that they put in between a couple of rows, but, but uh, uh, some bolt cutters or something else could certainly eliminate that. And you could have access with another, certainly in a situation where you had multiple trailers on fire or need additional hand lines, you could easily get uh, additional hand lines in from that area. And once again, now we're only talking about probably pre-connected hand lines that would reach the, the situation. So, so sometimes creativity may be important for us as either a company officer or a command officer. Um, also, if you're coming into a trailer park, I would tell you if you're second due, don't pass the last hydrant as you come into the structure. Don't come into the, situ to the park, which I've seen unfortunately in my career, many times where the first due company asks the second due company to lay them a supply and then they go, oh yeah, about that supply line, we passed the hydro. Can you get the next company maybe to do that? Or here's what we hear, beep, 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 as we're back in half a block down the road to get the supply line. So be careful about that. Obviously uh, hydrants and, and water supply on, on trailer fires and, and trailer parks is very difficult. So we need to be really thinking as, we, as, as to where we're gonna get our supply line from and, and how we're gonna utilize that. So we've talked about that, some of the access problems and challenges with vehicles in the roadway and and uh, the, the width of the roadways not being in nearly as much as, as standard roadway, so challenges making access. This is an incident that occurred a little while back here in Mesa. And you can see here that because of the layout, they had pretty good access. They had hydrants coming from both locations or both sides, multiple hand lines coming off here. Uh, they, they were fortunate not to have an exposure on the side of the fire here, so that worked out pretty well for them here. But you can also see that if you needed to, you could have laid a supply line in from the back side on the other road behind them and easily uh, because a lot of trailer parks either have no fences, small three foot chain link fences, and real typically has reasonably good access between the roadway behind there. So don't get stuck and caught in a situation where you think to yourself, man, I can't get any more units in here because of that. There's always a lot of times if we look at our overhead map, there may be some easy access just by laying a supply line in behind it and, and literally a, a pre-connect can, can not only provide cover protection for the exposures, but can get access to the, to the other side of the trailers and other trailers around it pretty easily. So this is our ideal situation. Obviously, if we have uh, significant fire exposures as, as engine companies coming in from different locations, coming off of different hydrants, as it gives us the, the best uh, situation we have as far as multiple lines of protection. Just confirm you said you're running out of water. So this is your worst case scenario as an instant commander. Got three pre-connects coming off of tank water and a, and a trailer fire and it's obviously still, still working and they're out of water. So just understand that, you know, we need to, this is, this is a, a, a bad situation because 
Uh, once again, it seems like it takes forever. Murphy's Law says that you won't have another supply line and then you'll have a bad hydrant or whatever else and it becomes a hot mess for us. So get that supply line and secure it early. Assuming command, just some things to think about here. We're just about to break here. I think we've got just a couple more slides here, but just, just understand as we come in uh, that we always want to consider the risk management plan uh, anytime we come into any incident, whether it be a, a house fire, a car fire, uh, whatever type of incident we have. And certainly with trailer fires, we need to make sure that we're utilizing the risk management philosophy, philosophy appropriately to make sure we're operating in, this, in the right uh, strategy. You know, we're willing to, once again, we're, a, we're a, and for the most part, the East Valley is a, a, an aggressive uh, aggressive agencies that are, uh, that we are very offensive ordin uh, uh, oriented, but just understand there also are situations where we are, when we arrive, we're already in the yellow or maybe even in the red, and we don't need to do stupid things by rushing into an area that, uh, that certainly isn't a survival situation and property that's already lost. Remember our tactical priorities for trailers and everything else are still the same. Rescue, fire control, property conservation, and firefighter safety are the same uh, regardless of where we're at. Fortunately, we can typically get, and I'm, when I say typically, get a search and rescue of a, of a trailer much faster than we do a residence only because of the sheer size. But when I say that, I, can, I would also tell you that, uh, that you know, in, in certain situations, that's not the case. In, in certain situations, it's very difficult to, to, because of zero visibility conditions and high heat conditions and then narrow hallways and storage and other things to be able to get a, a primary all clear on a structure. But that is our priority, certainly, and then fire control and property conservation. Okay, so let's take a 10-minute break. Um, we will come back at about, uh, let's see, 9.25, 9.20, something around there. So, so if you have questions, you're welcome to either text uh, uh, Captain Paul Adele, or you can uh, unmute your mic over the next 10 minutes and ask me a question. I'll be glad to answer anything you may have. If not, we'll take about 10 minutes and we'll come back and, and finish up the, the lecture.
Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started again. Um, also, just a uh, thought, I think uh, someone from Scottsdale may have mentioned that they have utilized either a split lay or, or doing a supply line from the street behind to get access. Uh, I don't know if you want to mute your mic and tell us kind of what, hap what has happened or what you've had success with in the past, but if you're online. I'm not sure if you're still on there or not, but... All right, can anybody, can you guys hear me out there again? Somebody? Unmute for a second. Yeah, I can hear you, Pat. Yeah, okay, Pat, perfect. Hear you perfect, thank you. Okay, so uh, so we're going to go ahead and move on. Uh, I know Chan or Scottsdale mentioned that they, I, I know personally that they've done split lays all the time and, and responding into Scottsdale for just regular residential areas that some of their South Scottsdale uh, doesn't have hydrants and, and listening to the crews communicate. We talk about the importance of communications, talking about, Hey, we're going to do a split lay. We're going to lay in from here, or or you guys finish our lay, or whatever it is. And so, uh, communication is very important uh, as far as establishing that supply line for us. So, so uh, thanks for that comment. Okay, so we're going to talk about 360 surveys here, and that's one of the things we need to do on every incident respond to. But certainly another factor for us is we respond to to trailer fires. But completing a 360 size up on on any incident we go to is, is very important. Um, you know, sometimes you think, hey, it's small enough as I pull up. I can see all the sides. It's not a big deal. But but I would tell you, take that time to do the 360. It'll help us do a couple of things that allows us to not only determine access and egress as far as windows and doors and layout of the trailer, potentially depending on on the, the, the window, uh, the, the design of the windows and stuff and how it's laid out. But it also helps us determine, uh, you know, whether or not we may have victims, whether we've got uh, our fire and smoke conditions, where our utilities are located, all those kind of things here. Uh, it also allows us, if we see fire under the structure, understand that we may have some challenges early on with floor floor failure and some flow path concerns. Um, but then also under, we can get, see that uh, whether or not we've had additions, uh, which may be part of our fire load, may change our the dynamics as far as fire load and our search and rescue operations based upon some of the uh, additions and other things that we see. Uh, we're also going to be always looking, depending on whether it's an RV style trailer or whether it's a trailer itself that uh, we may have on-site uh, propane tanks that we may need to either secure or protect at some point in time as well. Um, Captain Barnhart also mentioned something here over the break that I just want to remind ourselves, our, our crews also, is is anytime we respond to an incident of this nature, trailer fires especially because, uh, because of the design of the trailer park, a lot of times it's challenging for us to get a real good view of the trailer early on in the process until we literally almost get to the trailer itself to determine what we've got burning and stuff. Uh, your size up report is critical to the overall operation and the success of the operation. Uh, what's your description of the event when they arrive, whether that's going to be a, a single wide trailer with a working fire from, you know, one window or whatever, a, a room and contents type fire uh, that, you know, that we're going to be pulling a, laying a supply line, pulling a hand line for transitional attack, search and rescue or whatever we're doing here versus uh, arriving on the scene and, and talking about a well-involved trailer with exposures on both sides, on the east and west side of the, of the involved trailer. We're laying a supply line, uh, maybe using a deck gun or, or uh, pulling a hand line for, for, uh, for fire attack and exposure protection or whatever. Uh, whatever you say on, as you get on the scene can make a difference for our other crews coming in as to whether or not their approach, whether they're gonna come in from a different direction so we can get a second supply line, uh, whether they're going to come in from the back of the structure, if the third unit in, uh, or lay up, or, or position themselves so they have access to the rear of the structure, uh, if they've got multiple trailers involved or exposures. There's a lot of things that come into play based upon your on-scene report and a good description of what you have. So whether you have a, a working fire, whether it's uh, impinging other other trailers, uh, how much of the trailers involved, all those kind of things can be very critical for our overall operation and safety. So thank you, Captain Barnhart, for that comment. I'm sorry I missed that. Uh, also, but if you're unable to do a 360, make sure somebody else does because it seems simple once again, but there's a lot of things that can be hidden on the backside of a trailer or the backside of a, an addition and trailer. And, and one of the other things, just a reminder for 73% of all Maydays had a missing or incomplete 360 survey. So don't downplay the importance of a 360. Known or suspected rescues. I can tell you that I probably have pulled, or not personally pulled, but had uh, uh, just about as many fatalities in trailers as I had in, in residential structures here. Um, so don't downplay the importance or dangers associated with, with trailer fires. Uh, not unusual for us to have uh, victims in, in trailers and RVs. Uh, and, and in that situation, obviously, 
multiple victims may be a possibility as well here. But so you can see here, just two incidents that I pulled off the web here with, with just a quick search here was was uh, four people killed and six people killed in a in a trailer fire in these two cities here. And, and that was just my, the first two that I picked up here. So not unusual for us. Primary search, obviously, if we have, if we arrive and we are told that we have a known rescue, we want to find out that location of that, uh, the last known location of the person that may be inside. Uh, in some of these situations, it may be somebody that's handicapped or, or uh, has some challenges of some kind or maybe inebriated or, or just was last known in, in a certain portion of the trailer. We want to start a search in that location if we can, uh, just because we, as we talked about before, trailers can, can deteriorate very quickly because of the small size and, and make it so that the survivability profile is, is compromised much quicker than, than maybe in a residential structure. So if we don't have a last known location, that's where we're going to start our search. Then we'll work certainly around the area of the fire that's going to be most severely threatened, and then the remainder of the trailer RV. As on any incident we have, the initial all initial attack efforts must be directed around the completion of the primary search. Life safety is the highest tactical priority on the fire ground and should be on every incident we respond to. Resident reported all clear, just like we've talked about on, on our residential fires we talked about a couple of uh, months ago. Just understand any time that we arrive on the scene, if we have the ability to, to make contact with the resident and see whether everybody's out of the structure, that's going to help us out. If they tell us we've got a resident report at all career, it probably should, well, it should at least encourage us to move from green to yellow as far as our risk management plan goes as to whether or not we're going to commit crews and, and, and to what level. Uh, but you also need to understand that, you know, can we believe what they tell us and is the report reliable? That's one of those challenges. We, it's always a trust but verify situation. Uh, you know, we've had multiple situations that I'm aware of nationwide where people have said everybody's out of the house and, and then they go inside and find somebody in the house. Uh, I know I was, like I say, I was shocked if you were, if you listened to my house fire discussion I had a couple of weeks ago, or maybe the apartment fire one, anyway, one of the, one of the last the modules we had here. Uh, they had an incident in Phoenix where the mother was outside the house and said everybody's out of the house and intentionally knew she had a kid still in the house. And so they didn't tell anybody and they found a kid inside the house after they were given a resident report at all clear intentionally. So just when you think you've heard everything, you go, wow, I never would have guessed that one. So so it's like just anything else we do is trust but verify. We're certainly going to, uh, you know, if somebody tells us everybody's out of the house, but we also need to understand there's just so many variables, whether it be, hey, so there's a kid staying over that mom forgot about and all the excitement that uh, that grandpa's still in the back room. She thought he got out, but he came back in to get the dog or who knows what. So there's always a possibility that uh, that there may be a, the situation, the trailer or RV may be occupied. but. But certainly should help us at least a little bit if somebody's outside and tells you have an all clear. It's certainly if we're in, if we're at the point where we're probably should be defensive, and you got a resident report at all clear, that probably should steer you more toward the red versus uh, the the green in a situation like that. And once again, it talks about don't bypass fire to get victims. Uh, and so much of the situations, there's been a number of fatalities across the the country where where crew members because they were in the effort to try to to gain access to a known rescue. Uh, bypassed and went past the fire uh, only to have it extend and, and flash over and then trap the firefighters and the occupants inside and either injure or kill all the involved uh, because they bypassed the fire coming in. So I would tell you, if you've got heavy fire, uh, you know, utilize them, you know, straight stream, try not to use the fog stream deal, you know, we know about modern fire behavior, but if we can use a straight stream to try to knock that fire down while other crew members or other crews go inside and, and get to victims, we need to do so. Don't bypass fire. Uh, to get to victims and then put yourself in a situation where it's not survivable for you or them. Tick camera usage, uh, I would certainly strongly encourage that. Um, should be used both interior and exterior. Obviously, if we do a 360, we can see, hopefully be able to see whether we have any involvement under the structure and, and also do a 360. And because of the, the how thin the, the walls and other things are, we probably get a better heat signature off of that than we would necessarily a, a standard residential structure. So you might be able to uh, get a, determine the, the seat of the fire a little easier with a, a thermal imaging camera on a, a trailer RV than we might be able to on a regular residential structure. But but and then obviously we make entry into the, the structure itself, utilizing it to check all six sides, uh, the four wall ceilings and, and floor especially, because once again, our, our ability or there the potential for us if we have fire under the structure to burn through is, is uh, a real challenge for us. And one of the other things associated with that, you need to keep in mind that if we get burned through, if we have fire under the structure and we get burned through on the floor, it creates a flow path for us and it creates a very dangerous flow, flow path for us. Uh, because if somebody goes out and if, if it has already burned through the skin of the skirt or the, of the undercarriage of the, of the trailer or if it's a non-existent or if you have a, a uh, holes in the under, undercarriage, which isn't unusual as well as far as the skirt goes, that that flow path between the fire underneath the structure through the hole 
and then out a, a uh, exhaust port, which may be the sliding glass door or window somewhere else in the structure. If you're anywhere in between that, that's where we get flow path situations where we can get significant fire. And, and we talk blowtorch effect and, and the, the we talk about the hallways and other things becoming untenable within a few seconds is not unusual at all. So we need to be very careful about that if we have fire under the structure to be aware of it, address it early on if we can. So utilize the thermal energy obviously can help us to avoid, uh, to look at void spaces and, and above and below the crew as well. So here's a known rescue in Phoenix. You can hear the guy yelling for help. So he throws the dog out. But you can see here also, one of the things unusual about trailers are, uh, that not necessarily, well, it is unusual compared to residential structures, the height of the window. You can see here that the height of the window is probably at, at what, five feet or six feet maybe, the bottom seal of it. And so you can see, I'll go back a little bit so we can see it again, but they pull this gentleman out of the trailer here. So you can see here, I mean, that's not gonna be easy to get in or out. Plus, first of all, you probably with the pack on, you're not gonna be able to get in or out of that with the, with the firefighter as well here. So, so this is a, we talk about challenges. We talk about that 360 identifying uh, the the layout that you know once again whether determine whether or not this is going to be the the kitchen end of the house structure or whether it's going to be the master bedroom and other bedrooms looking at some of the layout there um, but this this gentleman obviously could have been in, in much in bad shape very quickly if they wouldn't have got him out when they did here so Top, watch the top. Yeah, yeah. 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 Come here, buddy. I don't, I don't know where he went. He's trying to get him right out. Get up there, get up there, Hoss. Get up there. I got him, I got him. I got him. Okay, so that's a known rescue. That was a situation they had. They were told they had a kid in the back room here, uh, manufactured home. Um, so fire, a PD, PD got there first, busted out the window. They could see the kid in the room, but he wouldn't come to them. They were calling him. They couldn't get in there, and the smoke was pretty heavy in there. Obviously, fire department got there, uh, went inside, and, 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 and pulled the kid out. It took them a minute or so to find him. But just understand this is an option for us. It's an option for us any type of incident we have, whether it be structure, I mean, residential or commercial, I mean, probably not commercial, but residential or maybe apartment even in certain situations where that may be an option for us. We don't do a lot of it. Uh, I've seen it probably happen three or four times in the 40 years I've been a, 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 a in the fire department. So we don't do a whole lot of it, but it is an option for us if we have a situation where we have a well-involved portion of the house and we have a tenable space somewhere else. And especially if we have a known rescue, it may make more sense for us to, to bust out a window, make a quick access there. And we talk about vent, enter, isolate means we go inside and close the door. We go inside uh, because understand that if, if, if that door is open in a trailer and you bust open that window within probably 30 seconds, you've got a flow path that may flash that entire uh, uh, trailer or make that space untenable literally within probably 30 seconds. So that's a situation where if you bust the window out, you wanna go inside very quickly, close the door, and then can conduct your search or whatever at that point in time. But uh, but don't just bust the window out, go and start looking around because you're gonna find that the fire will probably extend to that location as a new exhaust port for you and it's gonna create conditions that are gonna be untenable for you or any victims that may be there. But it is an option for us. And if you look at trailer fires, you know, not unusual to see a trailer that half the trailer's burning when you get there. And we'll show you some pictures of that and you go, well, is that a tenable space? It could be. Now, I wouldn't tell you on every situation to bust out the window and climb in there because once again, you may put yourself at risk in a, in a situation that there's just nobody there. And there's other situations you may be able to bust out that window with a flashlight and look through, the, look through there and see that because of the size of the room, you might be able to even get to see, uh, see whether or not you have a, a, prim or not a, a primary search, but a, a somewhat of a search of that area. 
but just understand that is an option for us. It's an option for us anytime, but, but with trailers, I also understand that once again, because they're up on that, uh, that platform, that a lot of times that window height is, is much different than it is residential. So you may have to use a, an attic ladder, uh, uh, you know, something you, you may have to stand on something to get in and out of that and just understand it may not be as easy as, as, it, as it is for just a regular residential structure. So just something to consider, just, you know, it's, it's a tool in the tool chest, not something we do every time, but it's something if we have a known rescue uh, that we can consider. But once again, critical that we go inside and isolate that door, close that door, otherwise we're gonna put ourselves probably at danger here in danger. We declare a strategy anytime we go to any incident we go to. Obviously, if we're on a, on a structure fire here, we must decide whether we're offensive or defensive. Uh, if we're offensive, we're probably going to conduct an exterior transitional attack if we have uh, access to do so. And then we'll follow that up with an aggressive interior attack and, and some report related support activities. Uh, if it's a defensive strategy, if we get there, and we're going to be in the red the situation. We're in a, uh, the, um, we're operating in the red. We certainly need to go with an exterior attack uh, protect exposures, get uh, primary all clear zone exposures, and then uh, use large, uh, large diameter hoses and other things to control the fire. Strategy and tactical decision making are the basic foundations of effective and safe incident operations on anything we do. So some of our initial company uh, assignments we'll talk about in the fire attack. Just a quick rule of thumb, just like with some of the other incidents we have, two in, one, uh, one support, one out, one on. Are, are some things to think about on a trailer fire. We need two companies minimum uh, on the interior of the structure. Now, when I say minimum, there are times, certainly in an RV, where you can't get two crews in there. You may only be able to get two firefighters in there, one in the door and one in the, the hallway, you know, three feet inside there, because that's all the space we have. Certainly, as we get to some of the manufactured homes that are maybe up to 2,000 square feet, probably looking at two hand lines inside the, uh, the structure would not be unusual at all. Um, we're probably not going to utilize the ladder truck for vertical ventilation. We just we just don't. I mean, unless it's a very unusual situation, we rarely will use the ladder truck for ventilation. They may be used for other things. They may be used for uh, gaining access to the to the uh, uh, undercarriage of the structure. They may be used for for ventilation operations, uh, uh, positive pressure or positive uh, uh, or other things as far as horizontal ventilation and other things. We may utilize them for, or they may become part of the attack team. We want one crew outside on deck with rescue responsibilities. Once again, don't downplay that assignment. Where that comes into play will, will depend on what the tactical priorities are at that point in time. But at some point in time, we hope to have an on deck with rescue responsibility uh, company in place. Because once again, these trailer fires are dangerous. Don't downplay the importance of, of the challenges associated with that. And then a company on deck would be, would be probably a typical trailer fire response. As you get into larger trailers and manufactured homes and stuff or double wides and stuff, you may have a little different setup than that. Um, but this is just, if you want to say, just a quick rule of thumb on trailers, but just understand there are very many different deployment options and this is not exact science. It all depends upon what you find on the, on the scene that you have. Once again, if you have a, uh, a situation where you have a fire under the skirt, you may uh, utilize that second due company to address the fire under the trailer and the third company goes in as a backup and the fourth company becomes on deck rescue responsibilities. There's a million different options, but just these are some, just some rule of thumb, some diff different potential ideas. Transitional attack, trailer fires, especially the single wides because of the width of them, it's uh, not unusual at all to be able to use a, a transitional attack just because if there's a fire in the trailer, you can probably reach it from any of the windows if you're, in, you're on that corner of the house or whatever, just because of the size and, uh, and the width of it. Um, so not unusual to have a situation where you have the ability to do a transitional attack on on a trailer fire. Um, so that, that would become a part of certainly a lot of our offensive attacks. Now there may be a situation where it's in a bathroom without a window and, and not an area that we can attack. So we may have to just do, to conduct a regular interior operation. But when we do have any situation where we have a, the ability to do a transitional attack, we need to do so. A fire attack on a, a manufactured home, once again, uh, is, is a little different than site built houses because of the lightweight construction and some of the other construction challenges we talked about before. Uh, make sure we have a reliable water supply, transitional attack, followed by an interior attack. Uh, another option, and this one I'm going to throw out there, and, and once again, when I talk about a tool in the toolbox, this isn't a one we use on every incident, obviously, but just another option that if we have a situation where we have a uh, fire under the skirt of a trailer, that may be a situation where a penetrating nozzle or a attack spike may be appropriate because of the sheer size of it. It's not, uh, we're not talking about thousands of cubic feet. We're talking about small areas. Uh, we're talking about aluminum siding that may be real easy for us to puncture. Uh, so that may be an option for us. But once again, this isn't something where I'm saying, hey, every fire we go to, make sure you pull out the, uh, the attack spike or penetrating nozzle. It's just another option for us, another tool in the toolbox if we're having difficulty gaining access to that uh, uh, compartmental space or the uh, void space under the trailer, it may be a consideration for us. 
um, but we definitely need to address the uh, the undercarriage. And I'm, I can't remember if I have it covered in a different area, but we, I, we do. I'm going to talk about that in a second. We'll talk about the undercarriage issue. So on deck with rescue responsibilities. Also understand if you happen to get to get that assignment, which sometimes we roll our eyes and think, oh my gosh, why you know why are we doing this? It's only a trailer, or why am I the guy, the crew that gets this? Please don't underestimate the importance of the on deck uh, responsibilities for a trailer fire. Once again, we talk about the dangers associated with trailer fires. They are extremely dangerous, but the challenges you have here uh, may be even more difficult than just a standard residential structure. And part of that's going to be because of we have small rooms, narrow hallways, small windows, a lot of the things that we have that, that help us as a rescue sector, RIC team uh, in a regular residential structure are much more complicated in a, in a trailer fire. Because once again, we don't have the ability just to bust out a window and bring somebody out a window if we have a flashover or something goes wrong. Because first of all, the windows may be at the five foot level, they may be too small, uh, it may be difficult for us to get in there. If you've ever done a Denver drill on a, on a four foot window seal, it's extremely difficult. Try doing that now on a five foot window seal with, a, with a, you know, a, an 18 or 20 inch window. Much more difficult, almost impossible. Also trying to trying to move, you know, move a victim. I know we've all done uh, firefighter rescue drills, down firefighter drills, and typically, you know, we'll get four people on 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 each each corner. We try to move and try to do that same thing down a single wide trailer, down a hallway. Not going to happen. At best, you're going to get somebody on the front, somebody on the back at best, and that's going to be challenging with other with hose lines and everything else in between there. So, understand that the challenges associated with a trailer fire, as far as an on deck uh, or a rescue response, rescue sector or RIT team is going to be probably as much or, or greater than anything we're going to see on any house fire or apartment fire. So don't underestimate the challenges associated with that. So as a result of that, we need to make sure that we do a 360, make sure we look at our other, all of our options for us as far as if we have to remove somebody, where can we remove them to or from? And so it gives us that uh, uh, some of the challenges. Also, what are we going to do if somebody falls through, falls through the floor and gets stuck either under the under the floor or get stuck halfway in the floor or whatever else. How are we going to get to that without adding an additional thousand pounds of firefighters around an area that's compromised already? You know, can we bring a, a, a probably can't get a roof ladder in the door, but can we bring an attic ladder in there or an A-frame maybe and throw it on the ground to span a couple, a little bit larger area to, 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 to fuse our weight just a little bit as we bring crews in in an area that's unstable? Just some things to think about. Hopefully you're thinking about those things. But, uh, you know, these are some challenges for us. Just, just understand that, uh, you know, we need to be, if we get that assignment, just like we should be on any any structure fire that we have, that be an apartment fire, house fire, anything else, we need to take that assignment and responsibilities uh, uh, very seriously, make sure we have the proper equipment uh, to be able to operate and, and do that 360 so we know where our options as far as removing somebody if we need to do that. So some of our sectorization, some things to think about. We want to use predictable sectors if we can. Uh, anytime that we have uh, incidents involving any type of uh, fire that we that we sectorize, we want to try to use geographical uh, designations or preferred. If you look at volume two, they they recommend the north, south, east, and west versus Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta. Uh, I know there's certain situations where we're on an angle and different things that may, that may be the appropriate uh, designation, but as a default, we need to go with the north, south, east, and west. Uh, I know um, Chief Lachlan has made that recommendation, and that is uh, that is our recommendation when it's appropriate. If you have a situation where, once again, it's on an angle or it just doesn't work, just make sure you have to identify the alpha side. Uh, and, and sometimes that's typically the, the address side, but if it's not, uh, we need to make sure all crews coming in understand the alpha side. Now, also understand that not everybody in the Valley is using the Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta thing. So there may be some cities that show up and you start talking about going to the, you know, the Bravo Charlie corner and they're going, I have no idea what you're talking about. And so, so we may have some confusion. We may have to say, go to the Northwest corner. So then you go, well, why didn't you just use no anyway? So, but just keep that in mind that, that sometimes there may be some confusion on that. It's not a, it's 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 not a standard uh, uh, terminology that's used throughout the valley. It's used a lot in in certain areas, but I know from uh, from Chief Lachlan's perspective, he's recommended we use the geographical uh, geographical designations when we can. And once again, you can see here on the layout, this is a situation we've got a supply line. The ladder got in first there. The engine came in uh, second with the supply line. Engine 208 is laid into the to the north side there, so it gives us access and coverage from from both sides of the structure. Multiple hand lines to provide protection for all the exposures on all sides here. So just some things to think about. Another predictable sectors. Once again, we talk about uh, north, south, east, west, and interior. Just some things to when we're starting to lay things out. Just to, it, when we have the ability, when it makes sense, we need to make sure we use geographical sectors. So types of trailer fires. Uh, you know, there's obviously a million different kinds, but just some of the ones we probably typically will see. We've got room and contents. We have carport fires. 
undercarriage fires, exterior fires extending to the structure, abandoned vacant trailers, and then fully involved trailers are some of the things we might see. So as you can see here on this, uh, the, the top one here looks like room and contents fire on that, uh, that top picture. Hard to say what's on the other one without doing a 360, what we've got involved in that one. But also remember, no two fires are alike. All tactical decisions need to be based upon conditions and pertinent fire ground factors found upon arrival in your specific incident. So here's some room and contents looking fires here. So if you pull up on something like this, a transitional attack is definitely indicated. We've got some survival, survival space, it looks like on all three of these trailers. So uh, I would do a transitional attack and then transition to the interior or keep that line in place and have additional crews move to the interior. Uh, but this is certainly one that I would feel comfortable being offensive on these three trailers right here. Uh, if anybody disagrees, certainly just unmute your mic and we can talk about it. But but this is a, a situation where, where a 360 and uh, and a, and a transitional attack uh, would be certainly indicated here. So if we look at it, the, the room and contents fires initiated a transitional attack, conduct the 360, check for undercarriage involvement, maintain door control. Once again, vent limited trailer fires are much more difficult than vent limited residential fires just because of the lightweight uh, materials that are involved. So it's, it's a lot faster for trailers to, to burn through the walls, the ceilings, uh, and, and the undercarriage and other things than you do residential. So. You're not going to see as many probably vent limited trailer fires as you will regular structure fires. But I would tell you, if you find it vent limited, try to keep it vent limited, just like we do with any other fire. If we can keep it vent limited and 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 try to keep maintain door control and, and hopefully the, the walls or windows won't fail if we get inside there, that we might be able to control it before it ever gets the oxygen it needs to to uh, to flare up. Uh, but just also understand that if we have a vent limited situation, that once again, we open the door, we pull the skirt, we bust a window out, a window fails, that uh, the, the, the potential for a, a catastrophic environment uh, or a, a deterioration can happen very quickly. And when I say quickly, I mean 15, 20 seconds, 30 seconds kind of stuff. So we need to be careful of that. Uh, we need to be prepared for that. So we initiate a rapid aggressive interior attack, prevent fire spread, conduct a primary search, check for extension, secure utilities. And then in a lot of these situations, we're gonna talk more about ventilation in just a minute here, but a lot of these situations, hydraulic ventilation is probably gonna be your best bet, at least initially for, for ventilation, just because uh, we've seen, and, and I'll show you one of the, maybe the next slide here. But anyway, we'll talk about ventilation in a second here, but uh, hydraulic ventilation is very effective on, on small space uh, uh, evacuation of, of products of combustion. So that should be an option for us. And then we certainly always talk about con uh, loss control and salvage, which we'll talk more about in a second. Now, the other thing I would tell you, and this applies not only to trailer fires, but every fire we go to, uh, you know, modern fire behavior talks about doing a transitional attack. And we've been doing that, what, 10 years now? I don't know how long we've been doing it, but probably close to 10 years now and very effective. It's probably one of the biggest things as far as improving firefighter safety, in my opinion, in my 40 years here. Um, but I would tell you that one of the things we often uh, forget sometimes is when they talk about doing a transitional attack, you know, most of the time we darken the fire down for 10 to 30 seconds and then we transition to the interior. But if you listen to the modern fire attack and other people tell you that if that fire continues to build up, you may stay there. It may be appropriate for you to stay there and continue to, to knock that fire down in that situation while other crews bring lines to the interior and get to the seat of the fire. Because if we knock that fire down and that fire was a volcano just before we got there, we knock it down for 20 seconds and we start working our way to the interior, that fire may build back up in the next 60 seconds where it's well involved again and back over to flashover conditions because we didn't get enough, we didn't reduce the temperatures and the, and the surfaces, the temperature of the surfaces and the, and the uh, products and combustion to a point where it, uh, where it, won't, con uh, where it won't slow the, uh, the fire growth. So there may be situations where that firefighter needs to stay at that door or window or whatever else they're at and continue to operate and continue to cool the environment. And they even talk about, if you look at the modern fire videos, they talk about after you knock things down, once you cool the superheated overhead environment is, you know, then we, we can even address some of the, uh, the, the contents of the room itself that are on fire in there to continue extinguishment if necessary from the exterior while other crews are working their way back and conducting the search and, and working their way back to the seat of the fire. So, so just something to consider. I know just the majority of us, obviously we do the 20 or 30 second, whatever it is, darken down and then we transition very quickly to the interior. But there's certainly situations where it may be more appropriate to, to remain in place and make sure to keep the fire in check. Also, just remember, anytime, anytime we're doing conduct talking about ventilation, ventilation operations ahead of the uh, or prior to suppression activities, getting water on the sea of the fire will cause the fire to grow. And this is straight out of modern fire behavior, and and certainly from my experience, we'll tell you that as well. I don't, I've got uh, I've got a hundred pictures of attic fires that that we've cut holes in the roofs up before we had water on the sea of the fire, and the fire got really bigger. Got and, and of course now I realize that. That was not the, not appropriate tactics. They got great pictures of them. They look great, but and the, I'm sure the ladder companies were exciting for those folks as they cut holes and fires went roaring, roaring out the holes and stuff. But now we've determined that that's certainly not the the appropriate uh, order for making a fire attack on a on a structure fire. 
Carport fires, uh, once again, we don't have, rarely, I mean, I guess some of the manufactured home, I guess I have seen a few of them that have uh, uh, garages. Uh, but for the most part, we have awnings, typically a carport situation with awnings. So if we have car fires, which aren't unusual, obviously to have a car fire under an awning. To, uh, so the extension into the trailer and then other trailers on either side are, is, is a certainly a very real possibility for us. So obviously getting water on that, that exterior fire as quickly as possible and then getting crews into either exposure as quickly as possible to conduct a search and fire, uh, fire control activities is very important. But, but don't walk past the car fire to go to the interior of the structure unless you have a known rescue. Uh, and even then I would probably tell you to leave one firefighter to keep that fire in check uh, and while you're conducting that search. Uh, fire down below, understand that the undercarriage fires not only that they're not unusual, I mean, I don't know that I've been to a whole lot, probably maybe 10% or less of the trailer fires I've been to actually started maybe underneath the undercarriage. The vast majority obviously start in the living space, but I have been to several that, that had uh, started in the undercarriage area, um, but can be very dangerous for us. Obviously, we talk about the, the ability of compromising the floor integrity and having our crews fall through the floor is, is a real uh, significant danger for us. Uh, we talk about flow paths. We talk about when that, when that floor above the undercarriage fails that it immediately creates a flow path to the, if you have any openings in the structure at all, whether it be a door, window, or anything else, that they'll immediately have a flow path to that exhaust port that, that if you have firefighters in between, they will create a huge problem for us. So, you know, a lot of times I'll hear our crews get there on the scene and they'll tell them, hey, there, we've got some involvement underneath there, start yanking off that uh, skirt and addressing that fire. I would tell you, you probably need to maybe slow that down just a little bit. Uh, we talk about using our thermal imager, making a small hole, maybe using maybe a six inch hole instead of ripping off a four, four foot piece of aluminum siding. Maybe you cut a, a you know, use an ax and cut a, a six by six inch hope opening, look inside there, see if we you know, use the thermal imager, see if, we're, if, if we have involvement in there. And then maybe see if we can, can, uh, can get conversion under there with the, uh, with the fog nozzle, just like we talk about attic fires a little bit, is trying to get conversion in there uh, with, through the undercarriage without ripping open all the, uh, uh, all the uh, skirting around it and, and providing that uh, oxygen it needs to just continue to burn and, and uh, deteriorate the uh, structural members above the crews are operating in. So, so just some, yes, please. Uh, Grab a mic if you would, please. I would love for you to. Chief Luby. So superstition deals with trailer fires a bit more than we do. And uh, for their fires underneath the skirt, they use a piercing nozzle, okay. they use their tick. And then they also will address a room and content fire same way they'll uh, use a piercing nozzle from the exterior and put out the room and contents in the trailer from the exterior. And I, and I was, hopefully you all were able to hear that uh, Superstition Fire Medical, that ha they have obviously a, a tremendous number of mobile homes, trailers and other incidents out there. And, and it's not unusual for them to use uh, the uh, uh, penetrating nozzle or, or, or a, uh, a penetrating nozzle to, to utilize uh, undercarriage fires as well as room and contents fires from the exterior. So just, we talk about that tool in the toolbox, it's certainly an option for us. and and certainly much easier to do in, in one of these types of, uh, of situations than a regular residential structure. So maybe indicated, I wouldn't say it's a use it every time situation, but it may be completely indicated in certain situations. So, so keep, that, uh, keep that thought in mind as, as we address these, uh, these types of incidents. So just, just understand undercarriage fire is very dangerous. Uh, the one in that top right, that's a, it's actually a video of a wind driven fire. The wind is blowing about 30 miles an hour in this situation. I wish I should have probably included some of the video, but it's incredibly impressive that it is like a blowtorch on the outside of this thing and it's blowing to the trailer next to it. it's on fire. I mean, it's, it really is impressive to see uh, what can happen under these, but just also understand that, that it's not unusual. I think we talk about this again a little bit in a couple other things, it's not unusual for people to have storage under the trailers. You know, when, when you got a, a 12 by 60 trailer and there's, you know, there's not a lot of spaces, you know, you got you build your shed and, and then, you know, that fills up and then what else do you do with your stuff? Well, you got a, you know, you got a, a four foot by 60 foot by 10 foot wide storage locker under your trailer. And so don't be surprised if you don't have, and, and we talk about, one of the things they talk about here too is just, you know, the, the tires that came with the trailer when they hauled it in there, they take the tires off it and a lot of times they just throw the tires under there. So you may have some hydrocarbons and, and you know, burning under there as well here. So be careful and understand anytime you remove the skirt, it is ventilation as far as if we have a hole in the, in the floor uh, space that we actually, that is conducting, is con creating a ventilation situation uh, with, the, with the trailer and, and the condo, the room, um, occupied area above. So just be careful with that. And I'll go, uh, just one final comment on that, just to understand once again, anytime we have a, a trailer with any kind of uh, undercarriage involvement, as we send crews to the interior of the, the occupied space, we need another crew as, as quickly as possible to start addressing that situation. We don't want to let that continue to free burn 
Uh, just like we talk about here, exterior fires, we don't want to let that to continue to free burn while we're operating on the interior and limited visibility environment. And we don't understand that the only fire we may have may be in that uh, undercarriage there. And I'll tell you a quick story time with Pat because it broke my heart to see this call, but years ago we had uh, an incident that occurred in a trailer up off of McKellips and Country Club, a trailer fire that occurred, and some of you online may have been there, but a uh, pretty well-involved trailer, a pretty good fire. Uh, crews got there, extinguished the fire, and, and did a good job, and, and things went pretty well. Uh, I just remember, unfortunately, famous last words, I was in the command post when the occupants came up and said, hey, we've got a bunch of dogs and cats, uh, you know, and, you know, we said, well, unfortunately, that we've got the power shut down the trailer. You guys won't be able to reoccupy it tonight. They said, well, should we take all our pets? And they said, no, we'll be all right. Well, unfortunately, about 2.30 in the morning, we get another call for the same residence. And now we're back and it's well involved now because of, and the wind's blowing about 30 miles an hour. And unfortunately, just, just like we know, there's, there's, there's times when just, you know, we, we try to get everything we can. We do the best we can as far as, you know, putting the rat in place and everything else. And unfortunately, there was just some small hidden fire somewhere that just, with the, the, the wind-driven situation that now the entire trailer is on fire and they lost all their pets. And so it was a really devastating situation. The family was extremely distraught, distraught and it was just, it was heartbreaking, but it was just one of those reminders for me and just like everything, you know, we, we, you know, we do the best we can and sometimes things, you know, are just a little bit out of our control, but we just need to do, you know, that, do our due diligence and make sure that we, you know, do what we can to make sure that these, you know, that we don't get a rekindled situation. And, and, and like I say, it was just unfortunate in that situation where, where we came back, the second fire was worse because of the wind-driven situation. So, anyway, exterior fires extend into the structure, just like we talked about. And if you, if any of you attended the house fire uh, discussion we had last month, never pass fire to fight fire. If we have a situation where we have an exterior fire that's uh, that's involved in a trailer that's got a, an exterior fire, whether it be a car fire, whether it be the storage locker, whether it be the trash can outside, whether it be debris, whatever it may be, if we have an exterior fire that's uh, that's impinging on the trailer itself make sure you address that fire. And, and you'll find that there, and there's been a number of situations where they've had where uh, even locally in, in residential structure fires here and, and then nationally with the incidents that have occurred where conditions have deteriorated, flashovers have occurred and, and firefighters have been injured or killed uh, because they didn't address the, the exterior fire before they went interior. Uh, you know, we see that fire and we go inside because we think we need to get that primary search, which we do. Uh, but the challenge we have is that the, we're not able to to suppress the conditions or, or suppress the fire inside or anything that may be inside because it's continually being fed from the outside. So this is one of those where we talk about, uh, you know, if we don't address the outside, it's going to continue to supply heat and energy to the fire developing on the interior. Conditions may deteriorate and make it impossible for our crews on the inside to maintain our advanced in position. So, so if we have fire on the outside, address the fire on the outside. And just like a garage fire, we talked about in garage fires a couple of modules ago, where if we have a significant garage fire, we don't just run into the house. We'll address that garage fire, and whether it means darken it down and moving inside, whether it means staying there and continuing to fight the fire and send additional crews inside, uh, same concept uh, applies here. If you have an exterior fire like you have here, uh, the first line ought to head to that direction to, to knock that fire down. If they're able to extinguish the fire, great. If they're able to knock it down sufficiently enough to go inside and allow the second due company that's arriving to, to continue fire extinguishment from the outside, fine. But don't just ignore that and make your way into the interior because the potential for for extension to the interior and, and conditions to deteriorate are, are, are pretty significant if we don't address the exterior fire. And just like it says here, if the fire starts in the back or on the exterior of the trailer, put out the fire or, or at least do it simultaneously. So don't don't just automatically go, if you, for example, that bottom one right trailer here, don't just automatically go to the interior of the trailer here thinking that we're going to fight it from the inside because a situation like that, you're probably going to end up with a flashover situation inside and you're going to be in trouble. Uh, abandoned vacant trailers. We see these every now and then. I know Tempe had a trailer park that they were kind of working their way toward emptying out because it was going to be replaced. And so we had probably 50 abandoned trailers in there. And it seemed like about once every two weeks, we'd get one on burning with, you know, just transients or whatever else. So, so, so it's not unusual for us to find uh, uh, vacant trailer fires occasionally in, in certain parks and in certain areas. Um, just understand that, that certainly abandoned and vacant trailers, if you thought they were dangerous before or even worse, because now you have conditions that, you know, they're then in disrepair. So you have people that have been salvaging things in there, who knows what they've done. And so you may have situations where, you know, they've either moved appliances out and left holes in the floors or, or you know, they've been salvaging copper and they've, you know, cut through the floor to get to it. So, so all bets are off as far as the conditions on the interior, as far as our ability to operate safely in there. So I would tell you, you know, if we get, unless we have a known rescue that when we get to abandon or, or, or whatever trailer, we probably ought to be operating in the yellow or maybe getting close to the red. Uh, as we are, as we approach, unless we have a known rescue of some kind or additional information, but but just use caution, just like we do with any trailer. But just understand that our conditions 
our conditions even at best before the fire started on a vacant or abandoned trailer may be compromised so our chances of our folks getting in trouble is even greater. As it says here, most vacant buildings have usually a low potential for civilian victims and a high risk and injury risk for firefighters. Floor stability, we talked about that already, is even worse than these, these structures than normal. Fully involved or well involved? And this is one that just, uh, just a reminder for our folks, and, and I've listened to the radio for 40 years now, so uh, I've heard hundreds of unseen reports on trailer fires, and, and I probably 10% of them, they say we're unseen with a fully involved trailer pulling a line to the interior for search rescue fire attack. And you kind of go, well, that's not really compatible with each other here. You know, that's just, if it's fully involved, it means there's no survival space, which means we should be operating in the red, which means we shouldn't be making an interior attack. Now, there's a difference between well involved, there's a difference between heavy involvement than fully involved. Uh, but when you say something's fully involved, we, we, I don't know a situation where we should be operating interior, even with a known rescue, because a fully involved house means it's not a survival situation. Now, there are times where you have situations where you have well involved, and you can see these trailers here. You know, the, bun, the bottom right, I'd say, is there's no survival space, and that bottom right uh, picture there, for the most part, it's, 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 uh, it's fully involved. I mean, it hadn't burned through the entire structure yet, but it's, it's coming out every orifice so that I can see here. Maybe if you did a 360, there might be a room in that back corner, but as far as I can tell, it looks like it's, it's for the most part, fully involved. The one in the bottom left, now we're talking well involved. We got something that's well involved. There may be uh, survival space in that, uh, the left side of that structure if, if we had a, a door closed on a, on a portion of that structure, but this is one where uh, an aggressive attack to knock down that uh, fire would probably help us determine whether or not we can make entry. But understand also, this is one that's going to be that floor just inside that door and that stairs there is going to be compromised. So our, our folks being able, even if we knock that down, being able to get in from that area is probably going to be too dangerous for us to operate in that area. So I would tell you that we might be able to go in from the, the door on the back side if there is one on the left side of that structure and maybe make access to that portion of that building over there. But certainly not one that I'm just going to go up, knock down that fire on the stairs there and just start working my way in because within probably a few feet of it, somebody's going to fall through and now you're going to try to have to figure out, you know, we've got compromised floor. The top left, once again, you got one bedroom looks like maybe up there that, that may be survivable if the door is closed. I uh, don't know. I mean, obviously the rest of the trailer is already burned through. All You can see all the studs and stuff. So that's obviously, uh, I mean, at best we might bust a window out and take a peek in there just to see if somebody's laying on the bed just below the window or something. But this is not one that I'm going to try to work my way back from the, from the center of this trailer through that fire to try to get to that back corner here just because it's not feasible, it's not survivable anywhere in that trailer other than maybe this front corner. So we talk about judgment calls, we talk about decision making, uh, we talk about this is one of those where, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, we're operating in the correct strategy and, and, and operating safely. You know, we can be aggressive, but we need to operate safely when we do these things. Uh, anytime we obviously have a well-involved or fully involved structure, we need to make sure we utilize big water when we need to protect exposures, stay out of the collapse zone. So that's a fully involved trailer. This would be no reason for us to ever get near this trailer. Same with this one. This is not one we're going to make entry, and this is fully involved. If we decide to make entry in some of these things, I mean, if we decide to go defensive on these structures, consider getting that supply line and using big water. Our deck gun is a, would be a great option here to darken this thing down, you know, get our supply line, use the deck gun, and then you pull, pull hand lines to protect exposures. So that would be something to consider here. Uh, you know, a two and a half if you don't have the ability to get the truck, if we're trying to keep, you know, once again, we talk about roadways being narrow and challenges as far as getting in and out of the structure. We don't want to park our apparatus right here on the street where we're an exposure to this fireball. So we might park a little way back and we may or may not have access with that uh, deck gun, but if we do, it might be a great option for us here. There's a deck gun handgun attack here. All units from Vegas 41, broad scene. Could be a single wide mobile home. Off, off, exposure on the uh, Delta side. I'll be in the attack mode, performing a 360 OAS monitor attack for an update. Be advised, we do have our own water source we brought it in with us. So, latest supply line, engineers going up top to do the deck gun right now. This guy pulls a, a hand line. So, we got an exterior fire, looks like it's extended to, into the interior. I'm sorry, both. I can't tell where it came from the outside in or the outside out. I'm not sure, but. 41. Go ahead. All residents are reported to be out of the structure. But it's got pretty good exposure there. If we I don't do something, knock it out. I'm coming to the getting reports of a uh, one occupant still on site. We can just confirm. 
We got the little moped out there. I'm not sure if that's where our jazzy, whatever that is. I'm not sure if that was part of the process or, or just uh, when the stairs burn. A lot of times the stairs are carpeted. They catch fire if the window or door fails and then it extends outside. But typically, you have reasonably good access if you work your way around the trailer. Uh, we do have a fire personnel on scene. That's a single uh, wide. So defensive operation. So we got some underskirt undercarriage involvement there. We've got obviously it's already burned through the skin, so we've got we don't have a vent limited situation. We've got well well involved. So the ability to make your way around this thing and knock this fire down is reasonably good here on this one. So we talk about that. You know, if we're going to use big water or big water for a, a quick knockdown. Make sure you get the supply line first here. Obviously, with 500 gallon tanks, if we pull a two and a half and, and we're flowing 300 GPM, do the math, it's not going to last long if we don't have a supply line. Or certainly the deck gun working for 30 seconds is, uh, is not going to be, you know, we're going to use all of our water at one shot and hoping things are going to work out, and sometimes it doesn't. So just be careful about if we're going to use a, a, a deck gun or two and a half or something of that nature, make sure you get that supply line established first. We talk about class potential. Here's the, the situation we talked about before. That upper left picture is what we had with one of my crews one time. If the roof started coming in on our people, it wasn't that heavy. So it wasn't, didn't, they didn't have air conditioning units or something of that nature, but it started failing. We probably were in a, in a portion of the, the trailer we shouldn't have been in. Um, but just understand there are certainly situations where awnings and overhangs and even the roof itself may collapse if we're not careful. So we need to expect early failure because of the lightweight construction. You can see a couple other situations here where the awning burns off and it's collapsed on, on the below. Some other trailer fire stuff, just to consider hoarding conditions, just a challenge for us on any type of structure. Can somebody mute your mic there for us? Yeah, we're just trying to get the hoarding conditions down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody mute your mic there for us. Somebody's got an open mic if we can, please. Thank you. Uh, so hoarding conditions are another challenge we have that uh, we see somewhat regularly on trailer fires. Uh, especially in the trailer parks that aren't uh, that aren't controlled as well as others, if they're kind of just a regular residential without, uh, you know, uh, gates and a, and a private trailer park, uh, you see a little more of this kind of stuff because the controlled trailer parks a lot of times will, won't allow that, the HOA won't allow this uh, to happen. But anyway, so large amounts of storage can create some huge problems for us. It's a challenge for us with any residential structure, but even more so with narrow hallways and, and small bedrooms and, and gives a tremendous amount of fire load and can cause some challenges for us. So, just understand that anytime we have hoarding conditions with high pallet storage, you have problems of entrapment with our folks. Uh, you know, you also can have, once again, storage in the undercarriage we talked about, and overhaul can take a tremendous amount of time, and, and the fire load is, is very significant. This is, you can see, just some of the pictures here of a, of a house, a, a trailer that Mesa had a while back here. You know, you can just look through there much, you know, you're not coming out that window or door if something goes wrong. Uh, that back bedroom there, if you're trying to get back there, in which you may have a situation where you may even have a known rescue, but this may be one we do the vent inner isolate search thing, and you might not be able to isolate because that door might not be able to be closed. So you may have to just bust open a window and do the best you can to keep the fire in check while you try to to, to bump in and, and see if you can and pull somebody out of a hole because a lot of times they don't actually sleep on a full bed. Uh, anybody that watches uh, the hoarding show on the, on, on the, the cable, and you'll see a lot of these folks, they just kind of have a little pocket that they operate and sleep in and, and you know, started out as a bed. Now it's just a little area. And, and so you may have a, a known rescue, but there may other, be other times where we, we can't make that rescue because it's just too difficult, too dangerous the location they're in. So extremely hard. Use, use caution because it's once again, hard for you to get in, hard for you to get out and hard for us to come recover you if something goes wrong. So a few more pictures here. You can just see what a, you know, hot mess this thing was and, and just, but, you know, just need to be prepared for it because that's going to change your the dynamics of this operation dramatically. Undercarriage storage, we talked about that earlier here. Just just understand that once again, that's one of the few areas that somebody may have to store items. So you may see everything under there from gasoline to, to car tires to bike parts to everything in between there. So it just may create some additional hazards and fire load and other things that we need to address when we start uh, doing our 360 and addressing the undercarriage. Exposures are always a challenge for us, uh, especially depending on uh, you know whether they're stored at home, like the one down below there, the picture down below, or whether they're 
uh, um, you know, just in a trailer park, depending on what, what type of trailer park, whether it be an RV or, or mobile home park. Uh, but typically, they're store, they're, you know, the trailers are typically placed no more than about 30 or 40 feet apart. Uh, so if you have any type of wind-driven conditions or anything like that, the danger associated with exposures is, is very high. And so we need to be very pessimistic in our request for resources in our placement of apparatus and placement of, of hand lines here that we can, so we can address that stuff. Uh, anytime we start uh, addressing exposures, obviously we need to conduct a quick primary search. Uh, if we need to, balance of a first alarm. I know sometimes we always scratch our heads when you go, we went to a first alarm on a trailer fire. But you can also, I've been to a number of situations where we've had two or three burning and, or at least two exposed and maybe a third one close. And, and you're going to need all the resources you can get on those situations, not only to get that supply line, but personnel and stuff to address all four sides. Uh, you can see here, you know, do not un underestimate the potential of these fires and resources needed here. The one down below is a wind-driven fire here, uh, that, and that burned up, what, and a dozen trailers. I don't know how many it was burned there, and then the one up at the top there. Just, just need to be prepared about that with that because of the, the distance between trailers here. Decks and storage buildings, we talked about that already, but just understand that just about every trailer park, because there's such limited space, will have sheds and, and decks and storage buildings and vehicles and other stuff in there. So you got a lot of exposure, which then allowed uh, the extension between the trailer to the car, to the shed, to the next trailer over. Um, so getting getting uh, a 360 and getting uh, hand lines to whatever areas to protect those exposures is, is very important for us. Here's another exposure. You got the a trailer stored between the house and a couple of houses here. This is also a power line deal. The power lines go down here in a second as well. So just one more thing to create a challenge for us. See the line back here is. So now one of the dangers we talked about, if you, you, your boss you, now, you got live go wires. back to the uh, electrical emergency uh, module we did a while back is, you know, that's a, a chain link fence there that that power line's above here. If that chain link fence, that electrical line falls across that chain link fence and energizes it, energizes it there. We've got some real potential for somebody to get electrocuted if they go up to uh, cut that gate open there. So it'd be a challenge we'd be aware of. This is an emergency traffic issue. This is one we need to make sure nobody's operating underneath there. We need to make sure our crews are are prepared for that if that happens so that we don't get somebody hurt. So the lines come down now. So ladder company functions, let's talk a minute about ladder company operations on trailer fires. Uh, a little more challenging for us. We don't, you know, because once again, it's not as standard of an operation as we'd have on, uh, on you know, a lot of our uh, residential structures and stuff where we have a, you know, a specific assignment for the ladder companies for, for vertical ventilation or to address that ventilation. So, so a few things we'll talk about there. We'll talk about, you know, are we going to do hydraulic or horizontal ventilation are typically going to be your preferred ventilation methods. Vertical ventilations may be indicated for some of the buildovers or some of the manufactured homes just based upon design, but I would say that's going to be a really isolated incident versus the, the, the norm. So for the most part, roof operations are not going to be recommended on, on uh, uh, trailer fires. I mean, we, we talk about here, as you can see down below here, this, uh, you know, or, uh, hydraulic ventilation is typically going to be a, a better at least start with and then finish with positive pressure here. PPV, just understand that uh, because of the size and the, uh, you know, the layout of trailers, especially the single wides with the, uh, the horizontal uh, uh, chimney situation, that if you fire up a, a, a fan in a trailer and you've got either fire underneath the trailer, inside the trailer, or something that isn't in check already, that you have the ability to create a flow path in a, in a really untenable situation can happen literally within seconds. So we need to be very careful. And, and Paul, I'll let you comment on ventilation yeah, of trailers here. As always, Chief, anytime we're using PPV fans, um, you know, we always caution that 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 is a manned event meaning you know i use the analogy you're not going to walk into a room throw a fire hose down on the ground then walk away and expect that fire hose to put put the fire out same with the ppv fan it should be manned at all times it should be constantly doing a 360 evaluation especially in these types of fires because as you pointed out that it naturally wants to draw air from beneath and if there is any fire underneath that skirt or area it's going to exacerbate that pretty pretty significantly we've had close calls 
we had uh, Captain Van's friend was in a particular event where we had just this type of, of situation where a fan was used. We did have some fire underneath there, and when, when it uh, took off, uh, it caused the conditions inter- interior to change within just a few seconds, um, and they basically had to exit the structure relatively quick uh, to prevent from getting burned up. So, Thank you, Paulie. And just, and just like it says here, as always, however, ventilation tactics must be properly coordinated with fire attack to avoid creating an unintended flow pass and placing crews between the fire and the exhaust opening. Just That's what we need to do on any of our ventilation operations. So we just need to decide. This is how we talk about the decision model, and this is one where typically probably command will be there. Maybe or that incident commander or battalion chief may be there before we start talking about ventilation. It may not be, depending on the situation and the location. Um, but uh, we need to really think hard before we start talking about PPV or, or certainly vertical ventilation on a, on a trailer fire without discussing the, the risk versus benefit and understanding the flow path concerns. So hydraulic ventilation, pretty effective for small area ventilation here. You know, you can see there's, you know, it works pretty well, if, you know, especially to clear small areas. Uh, the modern fire behavior has done a study, and you can see here that, that, that if properly placed, the hydraulic ventilation can move anywhere between 5,000 and 15,000 CFM. Uh, the studies they've shown if it's set back between three and 15 feet. Uh, and this one, once again, was different from certainly back in my day when I was taught, we used to get close to the window. Now they're talking about uh, moving the nozzle as far back from the opening as possible to move the for maximum air entrainment. So just some things to think about for us. Ladders, I was interested to see this picture of this that was from a Tucson incident. I have no idea what's going on there, but uh, but it's not certainly something we want to encourage our folks. Uh, but just we talked about before, we talked about the level of ladder. This is not something that you're going to be able to get into if you're trying to do a vent or isolate search here. Uh, you know, that's not something unless you're a really tall person, you're going to be able to get into without some type of uh, ladder or some type of access uh, assistance of some kind, uh, because the, the the bottom of the windowsill is probably about the five foot level. So um, so we may need to throw ladders in certain situations, uh, A-frame ladders, uh, you know, ground ladders on an angle, uh, you know, to, to remove bars and windows and stuff like that. But this is not the way we want to get in and out of a trailer if we can help it. But certainly do what we need to do to make access to our folks and get in and out if necessary. Uh, forcible entry, just understand that with one of the good things if you want to talk about manufactured homes and mobile homes is that we can make openings. Uh, just because of the, if you want to call it the, one of the benefits of lightweight construction is with our ladder companies, they certainly have the ability if we need to create a window or door and we talk about if we're in a situation where we have a, uh, a rescue, uh, uh, we've deployed the RIC team and they're talking about, hey, we're in a back bedroom, but we're having difficulty getting them out of here. You know, this is something where with a couple of chainsaws and <clears throat> a couple of motivated uh, ladder guys, I would think we could create an opening pretty quick to get somebody out of there. And, and, and Paul, I don't know if you want to make any comments on that one at all, but but you can see here, this is just a uh, structure fire. They were just gaining access to do some overhaul and stuff, but very quickly they were able to create some openings for you. Uh, Chief, the only thing I would add is, is this is very similar, I think, to um, garage type doors and we make access points. And I know one thing it's been, um, you know, years ago, we we did the TP cut and different types of approaches. And I think I would caution always on that. Uh, any opening we're going to make, I always say if the opening is not big enough for us to easily get in, it's going to be equally difficult to, for two or three of us to be dragging an individual out. So, you know, spend an extra few seconds if you're a truck company or an engine or anybody that's using saws or making an opening the way you see it rather than that TP cut. We rarely have the ability to reach up high. So take a few minutes to make that top cut as high as you can, two down cuts, um, drag that stuff out. I prefer out. I mean, I don't know that it necessarily matters, but in my mind, I think mainly I'm looking to grab someone and bring them to the exterior of the structure rather than push that into the structure. I'm of the frame of mind that I grab whatever I'm cutting and either cut it completely off and, and remove it. That's always best. Or if it's got to lay it down, lay it down so it's on the exterior of the structure. Thank you. Security bars, not unusual in some of these trailers, certainly depending on the neighborhood. Uh, and a lot of times you see security bars and roll-up shutters are not unusual, especially for a lot of these uh, winter visitors. Uh, when they when they head back to, to you know, Wisconsin or wherever they head, you know, they, they lock it all up, roll up the, roll down the shutters, uh, lock the, you know, lock the, the, the security doors and, and, and head out. So that may be a concern for us, not only gaining access, but once again, trying to trying to get out of those structures with either bars on the doors, windows, or shutters can be a real challenge for us. So we need to keep that in mind if we encounter these. And then uh, another thing that would seem simple, but these little decorative fences, freaking hate these things. You'd be surprised at how many times a hose can get tangled up on a freaking two foot picket fence. Uh, I've watched crews do this and just get I mean, just come out 15 different times out the door because every three feet it gets caught on something else and you're just going, mother, you son of a... And you're thinking, how in the world can this freaking thing be kicking our behinds? And it does. 
So just keep in mind that that may be a challenge for us. Uh, you know, understand the sliding glass doors. When they fail or when we open them, that's a tremendous opening as far as being able to change the uh, the size and condition of our uh, of the interior conditions here and creating a flow path for us. So enclosed Arizona rooms are everywhere. You'll see these, they're all over the place. A lot of times it's just lightweight, you know, little screen doors and screened in porches and stuff. But once again, creates challenges for us as far as getting in and out, gaining access and, and, and getting the uh, hose lines where they need to be. Securing utilities, sometimes is a challenge for us. Uh, in certain, I know we had a couple of parks in Tempe way back in the day that had a master meter. And the only shut off you had was inside the trailer on the breaker panel or the master meter for the whole park. And it was one of those where, so if you had a big fire, you're like, well, fudge, man. We had to shut off the park until they could come get an electrician to come there. And everybody, of course, now you got, you know, displaced people and just all the challenges that go along with that here. But uh, but most of the time you have isolated shutoffs. A lot of times they do have that shutoff that's inside, but then they'll have the pedestal, which I'll show you in just a second, where you, uh, they plug things in or you shut things off as well. But sometimes that's involved in fire, so that can create a problem for us as well. Um, natural gas propane, uh, a lot of these trailers are served by natural gas and then certainly some of the RVs will probably have propane tanks. So we need to look for those in that 360. So this is a situation where a firefighter got electrocuted in a mobile home fire here recently, what, uh, two weeks ago? So this is the propane tank we talk about being aware of that. We do that 360 if we see that propane tank there and we got significant involvement under the skirt or somewhere around there, something we need to address pretty quick. Here's our um, natural gas and electric you can see here. Uh, we've got the little pedestal electric shut off, but if you have a significant fire, sometimes that's involved because it's right next to the trailer. So being able to shut that off of the gas, you know, both of those may be involved very quickly and very early in the process. So we need to make sure we have access there. This is a trailer fire that happened in Phoenix. Normally we don't sh uh, knock out gas fires because I think it's, we don't try not to put those out because we can, can't see them, and but we did. But it looks like, uh, so I don't know, the fire went out after you shut off the valve, but it looked like it was below that, so I'm not sure what happened. So I don't know if there's still gas flowing here or, or what, but just understand we can have certainly gas leaks and gas problems on, on, on fires. So, so I'm not sure if we have an active leak with no fire now or what we had there, so, but anyway, be aware of it. Overhaul and salvage, just understand that, you know, just like anything else we do, we need to open up all those exposed areas, uh, look from, you know, in the, in the floor, the ceiling, potentially a little bit of the ceiling, door frames we need to check underneath uh, the, the and be careful when we're operating doing our overhauls and salvage that we don't have uh, damaged floors that we're operating on we don't get somebody injured as they fall through the floor during the overhaul or salvage uh, we've already talked about that under the undercarriage and making sure that we don't have a problem with that so let's talk about a couple of things here real quick so so if we pull up on this uh, this trailer right here um, you know, as we do our 360 here, the, the couple of things to think about here, we've got obviously small, ex we got expos exposures on both sides right now, but 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 the, the amount of involvement, I would be pretty comfortable that we're not going to have a problem with extension right now unless something changes dramatically. So it looks like a room and contents fire to me if I was to say that. So so coming up, I would do my 360 report. I got a single wide trailer, got a working fire on the uh, south uh, South or the east side of the east side of the of the trailer. I'm going to be laying a supply line, pulling an inch of the quarter to, uh, for a transitional attack, going to the interior search rescue fire attack. So if you look at this here, first line is going to go here for a transitional attack, move to the interior. If I can able, if I'm able to knock it down, I don't know. I can't see back here, but I'm guessing there might be a door and, and a stairs back here, but I can't see here right now. So I'm going to assume that 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 door may be able to be over here. So we're going to take that second line or that first line, depending on which one, whether he's uh, how long they're deployed, but they'll both go to that interior. Third line will be uh, on deck rescue responsibilities, or if we need to address the uh, uh, exposures or the undercarriage is what uh, would be what I would consider to be a, a standard assignment here um, for the most part. Obviously that can change and, and, and stuff based upon our findings and our 360 and and whether we have fire anywhere else, but just for a standard approach, this would probably be something like this would look, would probably would make sense as to what we're doing. You may or may not pull that fourth line, depending on whether we get pretty good knockdown on that, uh, on that transitional attack. There's probably a good chance that you wouldn't, but if you needed to, certainly that would be available. And if you look at the, exp exp and this is the, one of those situations I talked about before where we have both RVs and mobile homes and manufactured homes all in the same park. So they're all kind of just interspersed and stuff. So you have a little bit of everything there. So this is another situation here. So, you know, if we pull up on something like this where we've got significant fire here, you know, coming coming out the window here and the front window and has already burned through into the, uh, into the I wouldn't call it necessarily the attic space, but it's certainly burned through up front here. This is a, a pretty significant fire. 
But I'm going over here with my transitional attack moving to the interior. Second line is going to back them up here. Third line is going to be there for exposure protection or, or depending on what we have there on deck with rescue responsibilities if indicated. And then the fourth line is going to back up line, undercarriage attack, whatever we need to if necessary. So something like this might be a standard approach if you want to call it that. But once again, as we talked about before, this is all going to depend on the 360, going to depend on the fire conditions and what we have burning and, and all those kind of things will come into play as far as our, our assignments. These are just some possibilities here. This one is kind of one of those weird things we talk about additions that you go, I don't even know what this thing is, man. This is one of those funky situations where I go, well, it started out, I think, as a single wide, but then we did an addition on the left, and then we've got a full addition on the right. I don't even know. I mean, this is it went from a, a 900 square foot single wide to, a, I mean, a probably 800 square foot single wide to a 2,000 square foot, some kind of disaster. So so this is one that, you know, this is the 360 is going to be a, play a big factor in here as to what we're going to do. Certainly the first line is going to come right here for a transitional attack. But after that, it's going to depend on what you found on your 360. I don't know if this is just a storage area over here. I don't know if this is the living quarters over here. I don't know what we have. So a lot of that would depend on that 360, what we have. But, you know, if this is the living quarters, I'm going to read my second line in here. Third line might go back up in here if necessary or for search and rescue if this line stays out front, depending on what we're having. And then uh, certainly an on deck with rescue responsibility situation here. So this is this is one of those we talk about the variables that then we talk about build overs and i mean heck this may be one we do vertical ventilation because i don't even know what this looks like a whole separate house over here so i mean this this has some kind of trusses probably in a, an attic space and this is kind of a combination residential and trailer combination here so so this is just where we talk about the importance of the 360 understanding building construction understanding your fire ground factors uh your situation you have involved here so all that stuff can come into play here that isn't standard. This is one where, you know, a standard trailer fire, this is not This is not going to be that situation. So if we pull up on this here, what's going to be our strategy? We've got anybody online who want to kind of talk about what their thoughts are on this uh, situation or anybody in the room? You can unmute your mic if you want, but but looking at this situation, we've got heavy involvement here, right? This is this, we've got heavy involvement in the uh, occupied space here. It looks like I'm guessing, uh, it's hard to say here, but I'm guessing this may be the kitchen end of the house. I, I can't tell for sure here, but but we've got heavy black pressurized uh, turbulent smoke coming out this, this end here. So we're we're not far away from flashover probably in this end of the structure as well. I can't tell how far it goes down the other end, but it looks like it goes almost to the other end of the structure. So yeah. we're not far away from, from and Polly, please add. Uh, Sorry, I was just gonna jump in and say, Chief, I, I, I've been on this type of fire and I was gonna just make a note and say, um, it didn't look like that. 15 seconds before we got there, but the PD officer ran around, smashed all the windows out, as you can see right now. Every window is equally ventilated. Yeah. Um, and, and I say that kiddingly, but in all honesty, I take oh, yeah. away. Please be careful. It's happened numerous times. We were at Station 6. Um, our police officers got a little excited um, and, and thought they were making things better by going around. And, and that can easily happen. You get yourself in on this thing and you've entered that structure, and if they're still exterior doing what they think is good, and smashing windows out for you, your your situation is going to change to that in a in a heartbeat. And if you're not flowing water and cooling, not only the gases but the uh, the, the environment that you're in and the walls and the surrounding, um, it, it, easily that could be an after you know after you enter the structure. We've had that happen a couple close calls. Uh, absolutely, and that, and it's interesting because there's a lot of departments back east that they take out the glass. And that's that's their way of making sure we don't have a flashover is I can either, I have predictable behavior when I take out all the glass because it's probably gonna flash over. And so I don't have to worry about it failing and surprising me, I'm gonna take it out so it doesn't. And actually one of the, as I was reading through some of the policies for some of the departments that I was getting, collecting information for this, one of them talked about that, said, your next step is to take out the glass. And you go, whew, I, I don't know, I mean, it, it will certainly ventilate the trailer and it certainly will give it the oxygen it needs to, to, to become free burning. But you are definitely, uh, you're, you're asking for trouble if you're not careful because you're in a situation where it's got all the air it needs. If it's an event limited state, when it finally gets that right air fuel mixture, we're gonna have a, a flashover and it's gonna, with probably a very angry situation and, and, and a survivability in that state, that trailer will be limited, if any, at that point in time. And if we're inside, that's gonna involve us. So so certainly something to see. And, and like you say, Paul, you've got all the windows that have either burned out or been broken out here and hard to see what's going on, but but typically those windows should be intact and I'm not sure why. Yeah. So, so like you say, it's well, it's, and I know they're also not they're not of the same construction, if you will, of, of a typical house. So the, a lot of times the, the pain's a little little lighter weight, sure. so that they they have the tendency to, to let go or, or break out on their own. But but again, I don't think it's uncommon that we unfortunately see that where people think they're doing the right thing, especially if they think there's a rescue scenario. We had one similar with a lady they thought was in the back, 
And so they ran to the side that wasn't involved and smashed the windows out to try and yell in there. And where that was initially a great action, it immediately changed conditions yeah. within 10 seconds. And we had that, that fully involved, basically, uh, trailer fire. So this is the situation here. I'm probably going to, I may call this defensive. I mean, unless I can, do I throw a 360 and there's some survival space, yeah. maybe it's something I can't see. But right now, this is a defensive operation. Now, when I say that, that may change. And we can go inside and, and maybe after two minutes of, of knockdown, we might be able to go in this one end of the trailer here. But But to start off with, uh, this is not one that, because if you look at that, there's not any tenable space, at least as far as I can see from that, that where the fire is burning back, it looks like it's fully involved there. So there's certainly not any survival space. So you have about a six foot space on this end that maybe have a survival little spot, but it, unless there's a door closed and that's a bedroom, that's probably even questionable as well with that pressurized turbulent black smoke, which typically means it's beyond survival, uh, a survival situation when you get to that level of, of uh, pressurized turbulent smoke. Uh, but, but like I say, it, it would be one that I wouldn't just go in here and just say, this is an offensive fire. We're going to go inside and just start fighting fire and, and knocking this thing down. I would see what would happen after my initial attack. And, and as, uh, as we were able to review that a little bit and see if it's safe to, to operate in any portion of the trailer, we would consider it. But otherwise this is probably going to be a defensive attack here. So this, a little different now. This one, I'm thinking this is an offensive attack here. This is going to be a transitional attack. I'll probably hit these two windows here for a minute or two, and hopefully that's going to darken it down. And then I'm going to make a, an interior attack here. So this is one I'm going to do. My, see, you've got, we talk about that skirt under, undercarriage here. Uh, you know, that skirt's missing. So you've got, if there is a fire underneath there, it's getting the air it needs here. We're not, uh, you don't have a vent limited situation. So we need to be careful. I don't see that there's fire underneath there yet, but I don't know. So this is a 360 that helps me determine whether I've got fire underneath there between my thermal imager and taking a peek under that skirt here, I'm gonna have a good idea. I'm gonna have my firefighter do a transitional attack on those two windows here, and then probably make an entry into that uh, door where the black smoke's coming out of and try to, try to uh, gain access to the seat of the fire and knock this fire down. But for me, this is an offensive fire after a transitional attack, unless somebody else has any thoughts online or otherwise. Same situation here. This is a, a situation where we've got certainly room and contents. That middle of the, the, the trailer is certainly burning where it, well, it's not a survival situation, but, but that back half of the trailer, I would say, would be survival, survivable potentially if somebody's inside a room with a closed door. So I'm going to do a transitional attack here and then uh, make entry into the structure and, and for search, rescue, fire attack, but, but using caution and knowing that anywhere in this area here that's been involved in the fire that the, the floor may be compromised. So I'm going to use caution on that end. This is just one we created here, but just, uh, you know, where's my first line going? My first line is going to go to attack the exterior fire. So we should, that first line should go right there and start attacking the, knocking down the, the car fire on the exterior there, which will also, if we can control that, will also prevent the extension into the trailer next door, potentially extending more into the trailer involved here, and then have my second line go to the interior here for search, rescue, fire attack and stuff at that point in time conducting my 360, but my first line here is going to go to the to the uh, car fire in the driveway here. So this is this is pretty standard. We talk about, you know, we don't get as many vent limited trailer fires. We get a lot more of this kind of thing here that you're going to see that you're going to that you're going to see show up and it's and it's blowing out a window or door somewhere. But this is one we've got some survival space here, but it's going to I'm going to do my transitional attack and see what happens. I'm going to go up here. I'm going to do my transitional attack. And this may be one because the sheer volume of it that I may, that, that guy may stay there and continue uh, keeping things in check at that point, because this isn't just a little room and contents. This is a well-involved, uh, you know, fire that's got significant uh, involvement here as far as surfaces and, and, and uh, uh, fire load inside that structure. So I'm going to have somebody pull that line to there, conduct that uh, transitional attack and, and knock that down. And then at that point in time, evaluate whether or not I'm, uh, I have access to a portion that's unburned that we can, that we can go inside and conduct uh, offensive operations. But at least to start with, I'm probably calling this an offensive operation as well. Any other thoughts or? This is uh, the what what is pretty common with our trailer and RV fires. Uh, you know, it's not unusual for us because of the construction, the lightweight construction, the amount of involvement, how quickly it burns, how hot it burns, that we don't see a lot of this that looks like this when we're done. And so I would tell you, you know, that's why we need to be a little bit careful about, especially RV fires and stuff, about just really getting inside there and trying to get after it and and getting our folks injured when, for the most part, there it's going to be towed away and, and and scrapped a lot of times as well. But but we also need to understand that we don't downplay the importance of these things because for a lot of these folks, you know, and, and I'm not certainly not making light of the situation, but for a lot of folks, you know, they're in a uh, an RV or a trailer. You know, certainly you have the RV people, which a lot of some of those people are just 
vacationing and other things, and they have plenty of financial situations to deal with whatever they have. But for some of our people, especially in the older trailer parks and stuff, all the stuff they have is in that trailer. I mean, everything they own, and they because there's a reason I'm living in a single wide trailer in, in a in a cruddy trailer park in, in you know a, a portion of town here because I don't have any money. So everything that's in that trailer is all that I have, and I don't have any money for renter's insurance or, or insurance. So anything you save is means I either I come out of this with either clothes on my back or I come out with nothing. So I want to just reinforce the importance of don't downplay. Hey, it's just a trailer; it's not a big deal. You know, it's a crappy neighborhood or whatever else because. For a lot of those people, everything they have is is right there in that trailer, and so so please use just as much caution as you would for the for the four million dollar home in the Cindus as you do for this uh, single wide trailer in, on East Apache, or East Main Street. That just uh, you know that because uh, these folks are are, are just as, as just as important as anybody else as far as their belongings and stuff. So take good care of that stuff. So just in in summary, you know a fire tax should be from the most advantageous po uh, position to improve interior conditions. And that may be a transitional attack, that may be through the window, wherever else it is, or the undercarriage, but we need to make sure we're operating from the most advantageous uh, position to improve interior conditions. The best thing we can do for saveable victims is put water on the fire. And typically the quickest water is the best water. We talk about that a lot. Event limited fires are best extinguished in an event limited state, even though it may be limited for, for trailer fires, we don't get as many of those as we do residential fires, but if we can keep it uh, event limited, uh, we need to do so. But also understand that uh, because of the lightweight construction uh, that the ability the, the situation of changing from vent limited to uh to uh, uh, air air fed fire fuel fed fire can change very quickly if the floor fails and creates a, a flow path or if a window fails or a door fails or the skin of the trailer burns through that immediately can change uh, in, a, in a trailer rv fire much quicker than it can or typically does in a regular residential home Watch for fire under the floor. Wind-driven fires are best attacked with the wind at our back. Fire extinguishment is best achieved by adequate water on the interior surfaces of the fire compartment, and then water on the fuel. Ventilation is considered any opening in the fire structure or compartment that may impact airflow and fire growth, and that includes door control, removing the skirting, those things can impact our, our, our fire. Ventilation should occur following the fire attack or conversion, not before. And unplanned ventilation actions may result in hostile fire events. And just understand that that these these trailer fires and other things like this can change very dramatically. Not only house fires do as well in apartment fires, all those fires can change very quickly. But if for some reason it seems like it's magnified just due to the size and the construction features associated with trailer fires. So never underestimate the dangers of the trailer fires. Uh, for those of you that uh, that haven't uh, accessed some of the uh, the other 16 modules that we put together, there's this. Uh, QR code can get you there to our, to our YouTube uh, files. Just a quick knowledge about some of the information we got from, from different uh, sources here. And that's all we have. So Chief uh, Darling or Luby, you guys have any thoughts to wrap us up? Polly, anything to, to, to close us out? I don't really have anything. I appreciate it, Pat. Uh, good job as always. And uh, just guys communicate, use all the information that you have, talk to your incoming crews come up with a solid plan and um, be safe out there. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else online have any additional comments here at the end? Questions, comments, or thoughts? Polly? I don't, Chief. Appreciate your time as always. Okay. Well, anybody out there that's still online here, we appreciate it. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us here. Be safe out there. Happy holidays to you, and we'll see you next month. Thank you.